Good morning. This is Dr. Ova Tashaka coming to you again on the Dr. Ova Tashaka show. Greetings to all of you. How are y'all doing? I hope that you're doing just fine. Uh, this week's show is an extension of last week's show that was entitled The Black Freedom Movement and the Black Power Movement's Birth of Black Studies and its power to provide the purpose for Black Studies at San Francisco State University. So this is picking up on uh, something behind that theme. You'll see in a minute, those of you that have received the notice uh, have received the notice of this. So, you know, I hope people are doing okay. Uh, before getting into the show, and um, this is really applying to the show, I just want to do one news item, and um, that's Biden's recent appointment of uh, first Black woman to be appointed to the Supreme Court, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, uh, graduate of Harvard. And I want to say a couple of things because this show is going to be dealing with black power and some while some of you may say this ain't no black power this woman ain't no revolutionary that isn't what black power is about or any power and and i'll get into a definition of that in a minute but it's what you do to produce change and make others do what you want and um because Blacks were the deciding force in the uh, last election, you got a Black vice president. That was something that Biden had to do, and it had to be a woman because Black women played the biggest role um, in not only the outcome of the election uh, for president, but um, in the Black Lives Matter movement in general that generated the force that put Trump out of the White House. And so you may not know it, but a number of uh, Biden's uh, appellate court uh, justice uh, appointments have been black women. And um, that is him rewarding his base. And as a black man, I say, that makes me feel good, like a black man should. You understand? And while Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson could not possibly be a revolutionary, and you're not going to have one on the Supreme Court of the United States, one of the most reactionary institutions in the United States. If you had waited for the Supreme Court to end slavery, it would probably still be going on. Um, but of all his choices, and I read the backgrounds on each one of these, uh, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson is the best of the choices. And for once, at least, the Democrats are picking somebody who takes some stands, whereas they usually pick mealy mouth appointments, including uh, the current uh, head of the Justice Department, who had been Obama's uh, choice for the Supreme Court, blocked by Mitch McConnell. He's so weak kneed that he can't even take a step in the direction of doing anything about all the transgressions that the previous president has made. So talk about middle of the road, that's what he is. Uh, so what's good about Katanji Brown Jackson is that she's black, you know what I mean? She ain't African, she's black. And I can deal with black. And one of the first things I liked about her is that her uncle, who was put in jail for a long time uh, on a drug sentence, well over 20 years, she saw to it that Obama got her recommended, you know, recommendation to cut him loose. A lot of blacks in her position wouldn't do it because they'd say, that's showing um, favoritism towards my family. And they'd think, oh, this might hurt my career. She didn't care. You know what I mean? And she was a public defender. So I'm no advocate for her. I'm just simply saying that uh, given the choices, 
She's an interesting one and not a bad one. And she's now going to occupy the position that Clarence Thomas occupied when he came on the court on the other extreme. Thomas was uh, a right wing appointee in this case. She's not to be compared with that. But uh, he was outvoted. And so for years, he's been in the minority. Now the Supreme Court is really Clarence Thomas's Supreme Court. They should call him Chief Justice because he is to the extreme of all members on the court. And it's his positions that are being affirmed and is putting Roberts, who is himself a conservative, in the dissenting position because sometimes he sees some of these decisions as being embarrassing to the court, even though he himself is bad news. Thomas was the first one to uh, take the stand to really eviscerate the voting rights uh, bill of 1965. And uh, then, of course, uh, the chief justice now uh, could go ahead and put that position forward. So what's happening here with uh, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson is that she's going to be in the Thomas position of being a minority for quite a while. Three votes against six. She's in the three. But as sure as the sun shines, she's got the age and the intelligence to help shape a posture that it might be 15 or 20 years from now is going to shift the court. So um, whether that happens or not, that was a result of some power. But Blacks too often don't want to acknowledge it because it ain't perfect. Whoever said power uh, is perfect or is exercised perfectly. So uh, I just want to note that, you know what I mean? And I take my hat off to the sisters and Sister Sylvia Stewart, Hotep, and Brother Ogawa, uh, Hotep. Glad to have you on. Uh, so last week's show uh, was dealing with the Black Freedom Movement uh, giving birth to and purpose to Black Studies at San Francisco State University. I hope people watch that because that's kind of special. That department is special within the uh, field of uh, Black or Africana studies. Um, the, and last week's show uh, made the point that the Black Studies strike at San Francisco State was an outgrowth of the Black freedom and Black power movements. And um, the key point last week was that it gave birth to a radical discipline. I want to really stress this. It didn't mean all the faculty were radical. The thing about running something is, you define the position. And please believe me, with some help, but me leading it, I define the position. It is in concrete now. And that's really what happens. And that's called leading. And that's where power is partially vested in, though leaders are mouthpieces of their people. And so your real power comes from your people. Your vision comes from your people. Without your people, you have no power. But as the old saying goes, without a vision, a people perish. So um, it isn't just that the Black Freedom, Black Power movement gave birth to Black and then Africana studies. It gave birth to the most radical department. And while there were a lot of good scholars around the country, we had the strongest team. None was any better than Jacob Carruthers or Leonard Jeffries or a host of others. But we assembled a team, and I'm going to use this term again, of bad scholars, many of whom uh, waded in the water of the Black community and the African community. So um, that was last week. Now, as the primary architect of the Black Freedom Movement, the only successful one in the North, from the 60s to now, uh, and a key leader in the Black uh, Studies Department um, that provided uh, through um, a number of us 
a revolutionary thrust, but I was on the cutting edge because I'm the only major African-centered scholar that's a revolutionary. And please believe me, you don't have to be one to be pushing a revolutionary thrust. Many of our scholars aren't revolutionaries, but the thrust they're pushing, which is African-centered, is a radical departure from the system. And while they may not be radicals or revolutionaries, what they're doing is, and Sister Rhonda and Sister LaShonda, uh, welcome and Lao to Zoo. So um, this is extremely important. And the achievements uh, that were made both by the students and uh, what we did once we set up the department was a product of the consciousness of our people and the consciousness that we brought in to this space that helped us to uh, effectively um, build a department that was an alternative to what the system is uh, shoving down our throat, which is miseducation. So the most important question that you should have asked both out of last week's discussion and out of the discussions we've had on the Black freedom and Black power movements is, and particularly the Black freedom movements, is how did we do it? Huh? That should be your question. And if you don't answer it, you need to ask, your, uh, ask it, you need to ask yourself why you didn't ask that question. Um, so one of the reasons that some of us may not ask the question is that, um, we have a belief that if we're in somebody else's house, we can't control any rooms. And some of us have the belief that ultimately we won't be able to control the house. So we act like tenants in the house, like we don't have any power. You know, I built the King Garvey. I'm gonna use a direct parallel here. The Martin Luther King, Marcus Garvey cooperatives. I built it as a housing unit along with Jim Montgomery the, t the people turned it into a cooperative, some of our members included. But many of the people living there acted like tenants, even though they were owners. You hear me? Because HUD would give them an offset in terms of the rent. But we built these units so that 1,400 square foot unit, you could get it for 150 a month. How much offset do you need on your rent from HUD? You know what I mean? So sometimes our mentalities obscure the power that we exercise. We built those units. I didn't live in them because I don't profit from anything I built. But you don't need no tenant mentality. You're an owner, act like it, you know what I mean? So John Henry Clark used to say that um, some of us have been out of power so long that you know we've uh, lost the sense of how it's exercised. And so that's part of the problem. And some of us, when we have victories, we don't even see them as victories because we're in the woe is me syndrome where um, everything is what they're doing to us. The white supremacists, and you know, I don't use the term anymore because they ain't supreme in the world anymore. Yeah, they still got power, but it's going down. And the black freedom, black power, black studies, other movements is just one part of the proof of that, along with their defeats on the battlefield of imperialism in Vietnam, uh, in North Korea, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. You know what I mean? They're, they're going down. You might wonder, how am I on this show? <laughs> Good question exercise of power, <laughs> only if you support it, because the key to this is your support and your ideas. So uh, this is part of the uh, problem in terms of us being able to wield power. We have to really know what it is, and when we're exercising it, appreciate it. And when we achieve victories, uh, celebrate it, you know? There should have been a mass celebration all over this country uh, for um, our victory over Trump. Just like you have Kwanzaa and everything else, you ought to have, you, you know, you should have had big celebrations. You should have had Trump all over the place 
looking funny. Uh, so uh, instead, um, some of us acknowledged it, but then a lot of us just said, oh, yeah, what difference does it make? Any different from Bush? Oh, yeah. If you had seen Trump, too, you would have seen what the difference was, you know? And if he gets back in, you'll get a chance to see it if you go back to sleep. So um, today's show is about power and how Black folks successfully wield power under circumstances where you think it's impossible to wield. The Akan people of Ghana say that power is like an egg. Hold it too tight and it'll break. Hold it too loosely and you'll drop it and it will fall apart. Power is a delicate thing that is hard to gain and easy to lose. So this is one piece of power. Now, of all the definitions of power, and, and, and I have a lifetime of expressing it, the best definition, again, shows how heavy our people are. The best definition of power comes from Minister of Defense of the Black Panther Party, Huey P. Newton. This is the best definition by far. What did he say power is? He said, power is the ability to define phenomena and secondly, to make these phenomena act in a desired manner. Well put, Huey. It's one thing I'd say about Huey P. Newton, aside from the fact that he could kick some butt, he was smart, in fact, brilliant. And that is the best definition that I've ever heard. I've seen a few people take it and claim it as their own, or they might add modifications to it, which they should, if they do say so, but acknowledge the source. And so what does he mean by that? Huh. He's saying basically power's in your head. It's how you see things and define things. And through your head, and that is also your spirit, that part I'm not going into today, you know, uh, through those two powers, you're able to bring things into being. His definition isn't just define, but it's create, because that's basically what he's saying. Because it, it's just like a mother and father bringing life into the world. That is the essence of being a human being, is being creative. And that's the eth ethos of the African-American. Our ethos is creativity. We don't like to do the same thing twice. That's also good strategy. You know what I mean? That's also good art. That's also good everything. Things get boring if you keep doing the same stuff the same way over and over again. And in the game of power, you'll get defeated because your enemy will clock you, come after you, and do your behind in. This is a set piece system, and they are used to how things have been played, and they're not used to new stuff coming up. And that's part of what we're real good at. So when... Dr. Huey P. Newton, he got his PhD at uh, uh, University of California um, in the southern part of California. Um, when he's defining power as the ability to define phenomena and secondly, to make this phenomena act in a deciding manner, in a desired manner, there, this has a lot of meaning. So on the one hand, how you think is going to determine what you either bring into the world or what you reproduce because you're subordinate to somebody else's definition of power. So if you are following his definition of power, then you are about creating phenomena, whatever it is, economic, political, social, but ideas that drive those. And here's the deal. When you create a new phenomenon, within an existing system, it alters the system itself. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about here. And then what he's suggesting here when he says power is the ability to find phenomena, and secondly, to make these phenomena act in a desired manner, um, in defining your enemy, for example, um, then the exercise of power is to get them to act in the way you want them to 
willingly. Now, that's the highest level. Then the other level is to force them to. Either one's power, but the highest level is to get your opponents to uh, behave in a way you want willingly. You want them to willingly do it. And that is a part of what miseducation was based on in terms of putting us in a position to do the bidding of others. They didn't have this profound definition because black people are heavy. Not that some of them aren't either. Don't underestimate it. But Huey, right on, brother. Wherever you are right now, praise to you. <laughs> I decided when I got onto this, I said, no, Huey, got to stick this in right in the beginning. And by the way, the spirit of the Black Panther Party contributed to the success of the strike at San Francisco State, just as the Black Freedom Movement was the mother movement for the Black Panther Party and all other parties. And we gave birth to what some have called the best Panther, Donald Cox, Field Marshal, Black Panther Party. But Huey, bad brother. Bobby, bad brother. A sister, Asata Shakur, bad sister. Salute you. you know? So um, today's show addresses how we gain and will power based on real experiences rather than just abstract assumptions that have no grounding in reality, and how we wielded power, Black power, in uh, university and community spaces. So the title of today's show is Rules for Building Black Power in Alien University and Black Community Spaces. Now, there are other spaces, but I'm focusing on these two for a lot of reasons. One, it's one that I have a lot of experience with, but two, uh, these are central spaces. Our communities in the United States, our nations in the Caribbean, our nations in Africa, our communities in Europe, and in Asia, in some cases, nations uh, are the focal point uh, for power. The university, is a place where um, a society is reproduced. That's their role. The university, the public schools, all of them, private, whatever, their role is to see that that society continues. And so people th see it as the role of getting a job. Well, that's within the existing society. And universities are laid out so that people are ranked according to the level of the um, society that they're allowed to play some role in governing. And black people generally are on the bottom, I don't care what university systems they come out of because there's a caste and class reality where blacks are concerned. We're usually on the bottom of whites. So uh, that's a whole nother story. So, the rules that I'm going to be talking about, these aren't some playbook rules. You're going to go to a book and pull them out, though. These shows, some of them are going to be put in books. And so this will look like that. But these aren't fixed rules that we just dreamed up in our head. These are rules that evolve out of battles and they evolve out of growth. Mental, spiritual, political, social economic, philosophical, cultural growth. Uh, so this means that these are not closed rules. They're open. And as an organizer coming out of the Black Freedom Movement, uh, a youth at 21, entering, not really knowing that much, we learn to play the rule book of power like jazz and make it situational. And so we'd respond to the situation. And even though over time, you know, you began to learn some things and learn some rules, I always found that that was good. And so at my age, I still try to stay open. Good ideas, good move, moves, and to learn from the situation. So wielding power um, is itself situational. Power has uh, a lot of dynamics and dimensions, but the situation is also going to play a big role 
and how our power is moved in a particular situation. And I would say this, the key thing, uh, not just to power, but to life is to follow the truth. And then the tr truths will emerge out of situations as well. And so to be open to those truths and always try and make the best moves. That's, a, that's strategy, make the best moves. Do smart, don't do dumb. And do right, don't do wrong. So um, I'm covering two uh, basic terrains, the university and the global African community, because it's not just your local community. It's your local, it's your national, and it's your international community. And in looking at how power is wielded uh, in these two spaces, the university and the community, and this can be the nation on the continent and the Caribbean, um, the best classroom, the best place where you learn, uh, the best place for testing your ideas is a community. And so always these two are interrelated, not one separate from the other. So we're going to look at from an experiential base and then looking at what other people did as well, um, how you not just wield power, but successfully. I'm not into losing, I've never lost a battle. And a lot of us don't define the exercise of power correctly. It's about winning for just cause, but winning. King was right. He was always talking about victories, you know? Uh, defeat is, is bad, it's bad should make you sick to even think of defeat makes me sick. It doesn't make me sick because I ain't experienced it, but I could tell you I could by underestimating my next opponent. You hear me? That's how you lose. But if you understand how power is wielded, you'll find a way to win. And my rule is always win before you fight. Don't get into a situation where you got to scrape and scrap and hope you win. Uh-uh. No. You should win at the planning table. So last week's discussion confirmed this idea. It was that um, consciousness is really the key to the exercise of power. And this is consistent with Dr. Huey P. Newton's definition of power because it takes consciousness to create phenomena Consciousness to define it, whether you create it or not, and consciousness to maneuver your opponents so that they have a smile on their face. <laughs> and if you maneuver them after you defeat them, then put a smile on their face because there's rules for that. And I'm going to go into some of that. And, and that transcends any space, university, community, any space. So um, last week I was pointing out that the Black Freedom, Black Power movement instilled in Black students a sense that they could run things. Now that's a very important part of power. You run things. The first thing you run is your own mind. You hear me? The second thing you run is reality around you. And that does not mean relationships or anything. The success of power in a relationship is let your partner do their thing while you do their, yours. You know what I mean? There ain't no control. That's freedom. That's where real power comes from. And that's based on love. You know what I mean? Any man who's out to control his woman, well, he's either got a poor woman or one who is acting like she likes it, but is doing what she wants or is getting ready to, which would probably include dumping that person who is oppressive and dumb enough to think that they can run somebody else's life. The only one you can run is your own. And even then, in relationship, consider what other people think and make your best moves. <laughs> so the power of students to produce change at San Francisco State across the country, the power of Black movements to produce change, the power of liberation movements all over the country to produce change has got to do with 
at first, the fact that you see you're oppressed and you need to change it, but that you have a sense that you have power over your own mind and over your own lives, and that your people have the power over themselves. I don't care how much they're oppressed. You hear me? If you free your mind and your spirit, you'd be surprised how everything else works. And you won't be a bundle of reactions, you know, to white people. So this was the key to um, the Black Students Union at San Francisco State. I made the point last week that Dr. Nathan Hare had observed when he came on campus at San Francisco State after being fired at Howard for being a militant uh, Black professor. Uh, he saw that students had a sense that they could run things and their sense of empowerment came from successes. King's success, successful methodology in the Southern movement that a lot of us put down, it was successful. You hear me? And they said it was wedding together King's successful movement and ours because we had set the example here in the San Francisco freedom movement. Wielding that, which he said produced results with a minimum of casualties, which is very important. You know, we like all these revolutionary pictures where everybody gets blown up, shot, and everything else. And if that has to happen, then fine. Make sure you can win it. You know what I mean? And we just love to have our martyrs' days. I know we don't like to have people killed. And so success drives success. And so from King, they took the methodology of the march, you know? And the strike was like another component of that. And from Malcolm, they took the no compromised attitude, you know, by any means necessary attitude, because they, you know, they used all kinds of little tactics at state uh, that they called the war of the flea. That didn't all come out of King's uh, manual, you know. So success, effective meta methodology gave them the sense that there was a way to wield power successfully. And that's the key point. If you can't see success, victory in what you're doing, don't do it. In the martial arts, we learn, even when you can win a fight, the best thing is to avoid it. And I've got, had some pretty good trainers and the one that I have now uh, is a master's master, little guy. His whole life, he eats, drinks and sleeps, martial arts, his first rule is Get the hell out of there. Don't fight. That's the best way. You know what I mean? Well, we were watching all these movies where one guy's doing it in 50. That ain't how it works in real life. If you ain't got 50 and somebody else does, well, that's the first rule. You ain't going to win <laughs> unless you got a machine gun and they don't have anything. You know what I mean? Get out. <laughs> no shame in running if you can't win. You know what I mean? And sometimes no shame in running, even if you can, you know what I mean? But that's a rule for people who really know how to handle themselves. You might not think that's a good rule, but guess what? You never know what somebody's going to pull on you, and it could be the end of your life. Street fighting has no rules, you know? So um, these students did something that people didn't think they could do before. See, you know, we built black colleges financed with a lot of white money and very often operating on a European philosophy, but producing, producing technically excellent people. Most of our doctors, engineers, and technicians, you know, highly technical people, professional people come out of black colleges. You know what I mean? So that's good. But not too many of us had thought it was possible to implant within Plato's system, which is the system of higher miseducation, um, Black institutions, that if they choose to move in the right direction, could not only undermine the system, but transform Black students and others that went through it, you know? But as Malcolm said, the youth, they don't care about the odds. And some of the youth, because they were able to think outside of the system's box, they didn't have trouble conceiving that something could happen that their older generation would probably say that ain't possible. 
Because again, power is your ability to define phenomena. In this case, create it. And we often mistakenly define creation for blacks, creating something out of nothing, because we think we came here with nothing. You always create out of something. And we carried Africa inside of us and revitalized and rearranged it. And that became new African or what we call African American. And so it's how much do you have inside of you that can go beyond what the system has and the black consciousness, black power. And I want to point out the movement that was effective was a black freedom movement. Black freedom movements helped us to recondition our minds so that we could see new realities, new possibilities, new phenomena. Now, when I arrived at San Francisco State University in 1972, the San Francisco Freedom Movement had already given birth, which I led, it gave birth to the embryo of Black Studies, the Experimental College. I discussed this last week. And this was the embryo out of which Black Studies emerged. Um, and it was the product of the transformation of consciousness that a lot of us in the Black Power, Black Freedom Movement had also undergone. When I was coming into San Francisco State in 1972, in looking at the sixfold stages of mental freedom, and I had undergone a transformation in 63, and so it's nine years later, I was at the stage of, or stages of disturbance transitioning into Black and African identity. Black identity is what woke me up. Our culture woke me up, Black folks here. And then it sent me to the books. And so I came in to state transitioning out of disturbance. I was still angry. See this picture of me right here. That was 1972. <laughs> I was a walking terror on wheels. <laughs> Scared the shit out of white people. In fact, my whole time at teaching at San Francisco State 40 years, I only knew one white person and then engaged in the others that tried to, to destroy us. And so then, you know, after we whipped them, we had a relationship. But other than that, I didn't care two cents about the people who ran the university. That's a good prescription for not getting promoted, except if you know what you're doing. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I was at the stage of disturbance, transitioning, which disturbance is a stage where you see what's being done to our people and you're angry about it. But I was deeply immersed into our history and culture. And unlike most Afrocentrists, not just Africa. Africa was center, but African-American culture was key because that's what I came out of, my family, Black culture, my father coming out of uh, Bunky, Louisiana, a little small town in Louisiana, and my grandmother coming out of Mississippi. You know what I mean? They were the first ones to teach me the ABCs of consciousness, but they didn't really get over until my people woke me up. So I came in with my feet in two worlds, the African-American, new African as I call it, and the Africa, you know, both. And um, this really shaped my approach to how I, first of all, how I saw things, my view of reality was shaped by this. Uh, my approach to running a department, once I did it for 12 years, my approach to scholarship, to teaching, to organizing, to my own personal relationships, uh, it was shaped by uh, this consciousness. Um, and it was shaped by the reality that I had graduated from this university and realized that I had been brainwashed. That was my awakening, realizing that I had been brainwashed around the things that I thought were really important truths, like America's a democracy. I fell for it. A lot of people in the movement did. And I realized, I pointed this out before, that if I didn't know my enemy, I didn't know myself, it caused me to hit the books. But when I come to the university, I see this as a brainwashing factory. Now, it all depends on your consciousness, 
how you see reality, what you're going to do with it. Had I come here thinking, oh, a great opera, I'm going to be a professor. Oh, and then I'm going to go back to the books that I studied. I always be just Oreo studies, black on the outside and white on the inside. So I don't want to suggest that when I came here and people like Wade Nobles and others came here, we were fully developed. We had all our ideas. We were in the process of growth and development. But the key thing in my case, I was grounded in the essential thing that I knew this was an institution that I'm going to be waging war against inside of it. I knew that. You know what I mean? Uh, so this was like where I was at. In fact, I was in such a serious disturbance stage that for at least the first eight or nine years, I didn't want no white students in my class. Now, some of you think none of them should ever be in there forever. And they got the vibe because with me, when I threw out a vibe, people get it. I know some people that had the same attitude and when the white showed up, they quit. I ain't quitting no job because you show up, but you ain't showing up. I'm not going to put you out if you do, but you ain't showing up because I was at the disturbance stage. This is just for black people. <laughs> and that was good. You know what I mean? If you ain't disturbed at your oppression, there's something wrong with you. But then as I began to cool out, I realized, well, now this is not only an opportunity for me to radicalize black students, but all students. I'll get into that one at another point. And I'm not like most blacks. They change what they say when the complexion of the room changes. I say the same thing to everybody. You hear me? And if you don't like it, too bad. You know what I mean? <laughs> but that's because when you're grounded in yourself, you see yourself through your own eyes. And as long as what you're doing is right, you don't care about what anybody thinks. You do care if you're doing wrong and you're always listening to see if there's something you can do better. So when I come on state's campus, I had already come on this campus having learned some basic lessons in the street, having wielded not only um, power through leading the only successful black freedom movement in the North from the 60s to today, but leading it in the second most complex environment in the United States, New York being the most complex, San Francisco ethnically, um, second most in complexity and most in certain respects. And we literally organized not just black communities, but allied with other communities as well. So I came in with that appreciation. And um, I came in with the appreciation that Africans in the United States occupy a strategic position that is the most strategically powerful position of any Africans in the world. Because we're located in the center of the house of the most powerful but declining power in the world. Let's get this straight. When I came at state, it was just on the verge of decline because 72 <clears throat> is around the time that the defeat in Vietnam started to set in. But it wasn't clear that America was in decline at that point. But now it is. China's rising rapidly, and America, by just about any indicator, is going down. So I came in appreciating that part of the basis of power is positioning. And in this case, when you occupy a strategic position, then uh, you have the potential to produce a lot of change. So the theme for this show is rules for building black power in alien university and black community spaces. So you would think this is one of the last places you can build any power. Because the truth is in a university, a president just signs an order, your department's gone or signs another one, it's created. So they have like corporate power. They're like corporate heads, you know, except that uh, they often don't do it. There's reasons why. So um, I understood coming into uh, the university that um, our location, the location of Black people within this university, African people, put us in a strategic position because 
we could disrupt and rearrange the intellectual furniture, the academic furniture in this house. And that's what I intended to do. I didn't have the full idea of how to do it. You evolve over time and see the possibilities as you grow, then you're able to view phenomena in a different way. You know what I mean? And make changes accordingly. But we came in, and in my case, I came in with enough knowledge to know that if we could rearrange the economic furniture in San Francisco across the board and organizationally organize the whole black community, this is a right field. The question is, what can we do with this? I was in Cuba in 83 and 84, representing the National Black United Front with, I was national vice chair with the chair, Reverend Herbert Dowerty, beautiful brother. He was minister to Tupac two-time ex-con who turned himself around, Reverend Herbert Dowd. He's still alive, around 91 years old. He's became a strict vegetarian in good health. And so I said to Reverend Dowd, let's negotiate with the Cuban government. Let's get everything we can with a National Black United Front, which I was one of the four organizers of. Reverend Dowd was the other. G2 Wayusi was field marshal. He was the man with, you know, he was the architect of it. And Ron Herndon, who chaired the Black United Front in Portland, Oregon, was a key member. And Dowtry, like any good leader, was open to an idea. So we went in and negotiated. We got a whole lot of stuff from the Cuban government. And then at the end, the sister who was in charge of this section of the Department of the Americas, an African Cuban woman, she said, have you squeezed the orange? <laughs> Many. Have you got everything you wanted? And that was my attitude. That's my attitude towards anything. Can I get everything out of this situation? I don't care what it is. But in this situation, that definitely was the attitude. You hear me? So we, even though at that time, you know, the number of students at San Francisco State was growing was never large, just as it wasn't in San Francisco, our location put us in a strategic position to uh, change the academic house as it pertained especially to African people at San Francisco State. The second lesson I learned from the Black Freedom Movement was, and this was a key lesson, um, that when we moved, we moved everybody else because the Black Freedom Movement, Black Power Movement, the Black Movements for Liberation are the leading movements for social change in this country. And so when we take moves, other groups move. Some of you missed the point on the College of Ethnic Studies. You saw this as, oh, we're conceding to people of color. No, uh-uh. We led the movement. We woke them up. And it wasn't just there. When I took over the War and Poverty Program, I mentioned this a number of a few times before. It's a guy named in, uh, in Chinatown named J.K. Choi, multimillionaire, owned a bank, had been a general in Chiang Kai-shek's army, which wasn't a revolutionary army, but he was a progressive person. He was inspired by the movement. When I took over the war on poverty program, the way I took it over was through a coalition that I led. Half of the money that I got when I took over the poverty program went to the Fillmore and the Hunters Point, and I led that. I took no money. And then a quarter went to Chinatown, a quarter went to the Latinos, largely Mexican-Americans, right? We couldn't have won that fight without that because this was for the poor. Blacks were a part of the poor. I had to have the poor and I let it. And it was the same thing with the College of Ethnic Studies. It came into being through a coalition. These were Latino, Asian, uh, some Native American people who fought with us? Now there were more whites fighting than blacks because we're a minority at campus, but the students led this thing. And so when we had a college of ethnic studies, we ran it most of the time. And at the same time, each unit served as a support unit for the other. That's something you don't understand because when you have power, you know how to wield it. And we helped shape some of the Asian consciousness, you know? 
some of the best people in Chinese American studies told me black freedom, black power movement helped wake them up. One of whom had been a gang leader in Chinatown, who, by the way, when I took over the war on poverty program, the brother that woke me up, I told him to go in and a lot of other people that we didn't profit from any other movements. But when I took over the war on poverty program, the goal was to control it. And so I told him to go in there. And then the guy that woke me up handled the payroll in Chinatown. Blacks paying Chinese, but you don't think you can wield any power. Huh? <laughs> if you don't think so, you won't. And if you do, you can. It depends on if you master how. You hear me? How? And that's got to do with how you think. If you think powerfully and then you study how power is wielded and you practice it in the real world, because this ain't no textbook thing. Here, you hear me? Though this is going to go into a book. This is practice, baby. Practice. And remember, the whole thing is about winning for a just cause. So um, our strategic position, though we were a minority at San Francisco State University, put us in a position of creating chain reactions. That is, other groups were going to follow us. And then, of course, there would always be those who would line against you. But generally, if you exercise power appropriately and keep on winning, you're going to have more people on your side than anything else. And especially uh, however you do it, if you do your job right, your community will be on your side. So this ability to pr uh, produce chain reaction in the larger society, I point out before the San Francisco Freedom Movement had a chain reaction. We recruited people from UC Berkeley. We gave birth to the free speech movement. We changed the thinking of white students. Hmm? That's your power in this country. If you have a sense of power and if you have a sense of change, the Black Panther Party did the same thing with the Young Lords, with the Brown Berets, and with others. And Fred Hampton uh, in Chicago with the gangs. That's why they took him out because he had them lined up. There was one point in Chicago where, you know, uh, Fred Hampton had one line of nothing but Blackstone Rangers, gangsters, but who were becoming political. And the other, the Black Panther Party, they were forging an alliance. That's why they came in there and shot him. You hear me? Because the police want gang banging going on in the Black community. They want some drugs because they dropped them there. CIA dropped them there. They want some shootings because they put the guns in the Black community. That's what they want. They just don't want them aimed in the right direction. <laughs> so um, when I entered San Francisco State as a full-time lecturer making nothing, 800, I was on the bottom of the totem pole making 800 and some odd dollars a month. Um, knowing that I was employed by an institution that had brainwashed me, I knew what my mission was. And um, a certain time would come where they finally decided they're going to tenure us. Well, that was just funny because we went, we were lecturers for a good 10 years. The unit that was, though the strike had achieved a victory, which was 12 positions for a black study creation of a department, granted just a, a degree, and the same thing for the College of Ethnic Studies. Uh, there was no real. Um, guarantee those jobs were going to be permanent. And if you are forever a lecturer, all your department is lectured up, it's temporary. And that means sooner or later, they can easily knock it off. Tenure is the best union card you got gone. It's a lifetime appointment. So um, the university finally decided to tenure up long-term faculty in Asian American and in what was then black studies. So in black studies, that was Ray Richardson, a woman named Alma Maxwell and myself. And Ray Richardson, as I pointed out, was one of the two key people that got me out the state. When I got married, she got me a job. You know, she saw that I got work and then the FBI knocked me out of it. I could have beat them on Cointel Pro. Spirit said, no, I've told you this before. So. Ray and Nancy Kayu, they're examples of black women 
who when they see strong black men, they go out there and give them some support. Black men do it too, but the sisters have always been the one that's been most in my corner, starting with my mother and my grandmother. My mother with her high heels was out marching in these demonstrations. My grandmother, who had a couple of years of college, but could never equate that to a job, was working in white people's kitchen, and she'd take off work to demonstrate. That's the same grandmother who was inflicted with cancer, asking me a question. And the mother principal, this is my first chapter, she said, grandson, will black people ever rule themselves? So my grandmother took pride in this movement because she was a one woman, proud, black as midnight, foxy as a fox could get. When she shook it, it didn't break, but she was somebody with great love for herself and for her grandchildren. And I love my grandmother. And she had that Mississippi consciousness. And I go to Mississippi. I nearly got to do some shit to the Klan. They just wouldn't show up. You know, she told me what the Klan did. I said, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So black women have been key for me. Black people in general, because I've had a lot of black men on my side too, but the one that woke me up was a brother, but the one that brought me into the movement, Elder Hill Hutch, sister, mother of the San Francisco Freedom Movement, my mother's best friend. So I owe a lot to sisters. So when I go up the tenure track, I'm the only one being written up. There are three Chinese Americans that go up, three of us. You know? And when you get written up, if it stays in your record, you don't get tenured. That was the name of the game. Now, nobody had ever written me up before. I told you this in the last show. When I was, um, you know, beginning to chair Black Studies, my dean, Philip McGee, who, one of the leaders of the uh, Black psychology movement, Wade Noble, Dr. Wade Noble's teacher at Stanford, a brilliant, beautiful brother, took me aside. He said, you're the only faculty in this whole college that's never been a single complaint from a student, and never in 40 years. But suddenly, uh, various complaints. They ain't coming from allegedly from students, but manufactured complaints. I'm a researcher. I went back and researched each one, showed it was a lot, but they were still messing up my record. The spirits helped me out. The guy who was directing this named Garrity, who had a PhD in criminology, who worked with the FBI to try and break the strike, he failed in that. So then his mission was to see that no activist got hired at stake. Black freedom movement, Black anything, and better not be anybody that took part in the strike. And so in part of it, I got tenured because I got support. You know what I mean? But part of it was the spirits were working because what they did is he got another job at Evergreen College in Washington State. And then a new provost comes in and he's not following the same FBI directors because the director of the FBI was to kill uh, black freedom movement leaders, Black Power, Black Panther, they tried three on me and one to kill my whole organization, you know, low intensity operation. Read my book, Art of Leadership, volume two, because I had studied it, I knew how to counter it. Much worse than Cointel Park, because it's much more sophisticated. So I had already had three assassinations, an assassination attempt, an attempt to take my job, which they did only because I let them, because I could have beat them on that. Um, but now, you know, this effort to deny me tenure. Now, one of the objectives in COINTELPRO, uh, in addition to killing you, imprisoning you, exiling you, it was to see that activists could not teach the youth, Black activists. They wanted to do that separation. They've been fairly successful at that because you got the generation gap going on now, you know? And because of what they did by driving drugs and gangster mentalities and stuff in the black community, it did drive a wedge between the youth and the elders, but not all of them. And the hip hop generation is rising up with Black Lives Matter and other movements. But Malcolm had made a prediction. He said that the generation of today knows what it wants. He said the gener and that was the generation of the 60s. He said the next generation would know how to get it. That prophecy broke down. And Malcolm's prophecies were usually good. Why? Because powerful horse, forces hit the black community. I talk about that in a choice between two cultures, you know? So 
when it came to the FBI's move, it was to see that militants, now I'm far from, I'm, I'm a lot more than a militant, would not teach our youth. That was a thing. Break it. Do everything you could. So uh, that was uh, their move. So when they start moving on me, I have a decision to make. The decision is, will I fight this or not? Normally, there's not even, a, even a, any question, but I have to give it some thought because I naturally fight. But in this particular case, I had to give it thought. So I asked for opinions. I was walking around asking different people, and I was thinking about it myself, weighing it. Because you also didn't know if you're going to win this fight. Even though I've never lost one, each battle, you don't know if you're going to win or lose. Uh, and a lot of other reasons. So I asked. And so some people were telling me this. They were saying, well, what's the point of fighting for this? This is just a teaching job. I said, okay. Now, I've made, I had made one bad decision listening to advice before. One bad one. I won't tell you what it was. It was something minor. And then I realized that it was okay for listening to the advice, but I took the wrong advice and I learned a lesson. And the lesson was you have to live with whatever decisions you make. And if you're taking someone else's advice and if it's wrong, that person isn't even going to remember the advice they gave you. But you had better be clear. It will be your life that's affected by that. And doesn't mean that they intentionally led you wrong. So I started to think about it. Uh, should I fight? So, um, the, you know, the question was then, um, why was the FBI coming after me? Um, so that was a key question, you know, in, in making the decision. Wasn't the, the answer to that wasn't going to be the sole answer, but, uh, you know, sole basis for my decision. Um, so I began to think, okay, why? Well, because obviously I'm going to be able to influence the thinking of students, black students and other students um, in a very important institution of higher education. Um, in addition, you know, you heard Malcolm's mother's advice to Malcolm about don't serve time makes time serve you. You remember that one? And Lao Tzu had some interesting questions based off of that. And um, so I thought, well, now here's another reason that it's in my interest to do this job. Aside from the fact that I was discovering that this is something I'm good at, because a lot of people know what their path is in life. And a lot of people have to find out. I'm in the second category. So I wasn't fully aware of how this job fully matched <clears throat> my abilities and interests. So I, I looked at another component of this job. <clears throat> I'm going to get four months off a year with pay to travel, right, do anything I want to do, and then only have to work two to three days a week, depending on whether I get a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule or Tuesday, Thursday. Now, because I do prep time, I put a lot of time, three hours for every class I taught. I never went into class unprepared. So, but still, that's a lot of time. Now, me, I don't care what time I'm going to get. I'm going to make time for whatever needs to be done. If I was in prison, I'd be doing my stuff. But I ain't planning to be in no prison, you know. So that was another point. Um, so. I concluded, well, in other words, if I fight and win this thing, the system is going to finance me, a revolutionary, uh, for the rest of my life, doing what I love doing. I'm just discovering that I loved it. You know what I mean? I'm just discovering that that was a talent. I knew I was an organizer. I'm just finding out, okay, I can do this. Um, and then... The benefits were later, I didn't see this when I'm doing the weighing, that this is the opportunity, one of many opportunities to grow because it's not just the state interaction with students and whatnot, but it's what I'm doing in the community around the world. Uh, and here's another plus, which I really wasn't looking for because I never cared too much about this. 
you're getting legitimacy to undermine the system because professors are really respected. Guess what? <laughs> Put professor in front of your name. Huh? Huh? That didn't mean too much to me. But the point is that was an added benefit. And later on, I would just see how useful that was. You know what I mean? So um, that led to the conclusion that, yeah, I'm going to fight this. Forget this advice. This is just another job. Yeah, really? <laughs> so the title for this show is Rules for Building Black Power in Alien University and Black Community Spaces. <clears throat> so why do I use the term spaces? This is real important. When I describe the alien university environment, you should know that it's alien. We'll go into that. The University of the Academy is the place where students are trained to continue or reproduce the Euro-American society. Through learning the various disciplines that enable them to uphold these different components of the society, the philosophy, history, politics, literature, culture, science, economics, religion, system of teaching, though for teachers that never taught this, even though they have their own, which is called pedagogy. They just send them in the classroom. <clears throat> Teaching universities generally don't teach pedagogy. Like medical schools don't teach most doctors nutrition. Isn't that funny? The most essential thing you need to learn for each one. Of course, with pedagogy, you need to know the content of what you're teaching and live it. That, of course, is not required in the university system. This is the place where you learn their culture, their science, their economics, their religion, all of which are oppressive to African people and people of color and are oppressive to whites, though they don't realize it. Some do, most don't. So spaces, we're coming into a space that we have to create, which becomes black studies, but it is an environment, it's in an environment where the various institutions around you are hostile and um, they're out to perpetuate um, their system that comes down on your head. And your students are going to be trained in these systems. So your space has got to be about opposing that, but providing an alternative to that. Now, Carter G. Woodson, in his classic book, Miseducation of the Negro, <clears throat> basically defined the effects of uh, this alien university system, which he underwent. He had been a coal miner, uh, son of a coal miner, was a coal miner himself, had gone to Harvard and got a PhD in history. And then he said it took him 30 years to undo is Harvard miseducation, and he's one of our great scholars. And while I'm going to have a little criticism, it is nothing heavy. This is a heavyweight. This is a giant. And his book, Miseducation of the Negro, is one of the greatest classics ever written, which is, interestingly enough, a series of newspaper articles systematically written uh, on this subject of miseducation. So uh, in this work, he makes the point that um, the Negro had been, because that was a term they used then for us, had been miseducated through a curriculum that taught them to love whites and hate blacks. Um, because the white intellectual diet that they were fed, that I just described all these different disciplines, was one that defamed, defamed, D-E-F-A-M-E-D, -E the African personality, the African being, the African person, the African humanity. In fact, they took you out of humanity and took you out of history. So the miseducated Negro, as Carter G. Woodson called him or her, was through miseducation brainwashed to hate themselves. And because they had internalized this miseducation that made them functionally illiterate and useful, useless for their own people, they were put on remote control and would do the master's bidding without being told to do so. And this is the great insight of Woodson. By the way, 
um, American education in general for whites, even though it teaches them their history, culture, and whatnot, uh, falsely usually, uh, is also designed to put them on remote control. And Thomas Dewey is the architect of that. And he's their best educator. And they teach whites through getting them to conform to the group, you know? And it's a form of remote control. Again, serving those who run the society. So when you're talking about white supremacy and all white people, white people have power, no, they don't, you know what I mean? They may identify with this power, but they're manipulated by it. It's just that they don't see it. And some of us don't either. And that was our mission to uh, free us from that. So when I describe the Euro-American university as an alien space, I mean, it's a space that serves the purpose of alienating blacks or African people or people of color from themselves and from their people and makes them agents for the oppressor. And that is really the role of the middle class in any society is to serve those that run the society. The middle class doesn't run society, it's the rulers of society. And the Harvards create the high scale managers among whites, those that penetrate that level. Some of them manage corporations, some of them are major administrators, some of them are sent in to manage the government. So that's, that's the role. And, and for blacks, it's particularly devastating because it deals with your identity to control you. It's, it's really um, distorting your personality if you buy into it and your view of yourself and creating all kinds of insecurities and doubts and everything else. And most importantly, depriving you a sense of self-love. So uh, Woodson described this though, the agent part, that's my description, that's not his, the agents of the system and so forth. So Woodson's description uh, was basically accurate that an alien uh, curriculum creates an alien mindset, turns people against themselves, against their own people. Uh, so he was correct in this fundamental definition, but he made three errors, two of which he's not responsible, cannot be held responsible for, and one of which it reflects his circumstance, meaning that there were some things that, that he got uh, out of his head from Harvard, but there uh, were some things that remain, not just from Harvard, but from the plantation. So two of his errors, um, I don't fault him for, because based on his time, uh, it would have required him to be out of his time and circumstance to be able to really see this. So when he defined um, what was wrong with Western education that led to miseducation, uh, he left out science. That was an error. Uh, but it's an understandable error because at that time, the assumption was that science was objective, that everywhere in the world, science worked the same way. Um, we now know there's a thing called the philosophy of science. And what's wrong with Western science is the philosophy that drives it, that endangers the planet. When I go into, because I'm going to do uh, another part on this Black study series that will uh, be done at state and will be broadcast on this channel, I'll be going on the transition from black studies to Africana studies. I'm not going to go into this today. And my book that I'm finishing uh, on pedagogy also covers this. So it's the philosophy of science that endangers the planet, along with the philosophy of a whole lot of other areas of Western thought. It's not science, it's a philosophy. I'm not going into that today. But what I will say is that he couldn't see that because um, we didn't have enough knowledge of African systems to appreciate the African view of science, let alone Native American or Asian, that are uh, provide a philosophical approach for science and for society, not just science, that creates harmony uh, between 
humanity and mother nature and the cosmos. I did a show on the spiritual blues, the philosophy of the spiritual blues, the philosophy for saving the planet and went through this. You should check that one out. So um, I don't fault him for this, given uh, what we knew then, we couldn't know any better, you know. Um, and the second thing that he left out, I don't fault him on either, was pedagogy. When he listed all the disciplines that miseducate us, he left that out because he thought that the problem was solely the problem of the misinformation in our education. He didn't understand that the, uh, the educational methodology was just as much of a problem as the misinformation. And in fact, if you teach, and I've said this before, you won't really understand how this goes until this book comes out on Seba, um, because it's a replacement pedagogy or replacement system, which is better called Seba uh, system, which is what I do. I replace, I do replacement systems, I'm revolutionary, you know. So you won't fully understand this until I go through it because we're using their system, their method for teaching to teach our knowledge. And therefore it even distorts our knowledge and biases us against certain core elements of uh, our knowledge. Most African-centered scholars also have that problem. So he left that out, but given his time, he didn't know what the African system was. And while there were some Africans here practicing it, like George Washington Carver, um, and that was because he drew from within himself. He knew basically what education was and what it wasn't. But most of us get exposed to this teaching method through public schools and particularly higher miseducation. So uh, he could not know this. Um, but the real problem that affected Carter G. Woodson, and it's an obstacle that the uh, Black and Africana Studies discipline uh, had to overcome, those who taught it had better over, have overcame it, or they would be into the pits of the Western system. And so this one had to do with um, a legacy of enslavement that Carter G. Woodson had largely freed himself from. And some of our people were working to free themselves on, and a lot of us still are working to free ourselves on, but hadn't fully freed himself from. And his error, and this is one that a lot of us make, was his failure to see that at the seat of the problem of miseducation, is a European, Euro-American historical and cultural diet covering all the gamut of their culture. What he didn't realize was that if we're going to free ourselves from this, it not only requires that we go off of remote control, on uh, the information they have given us, but that we have to have a healthy African and African-American identity that is firmly instilled inside of us so that we have an alternative to view this alien world, this alien miseducational system, and we have the ability to think freely for ourselves, empower ourselves, and run the things in our lives, starting with our own mind and then the institutions and everything else. So Woodson's error was stated in this statement by him, quote, we are not all Africans, moreover, because many of us were not born in Africa, and we are not all Afro-Americans because few of us are natives of Africa transplanted to America. Now, again, I understand why I took this position. This is the position of the majority of Black people in this country. They're Black. They ain't African. And when we shifted the discipline from Black to Africana studies, uh, we got some real interesting, not surprising reactions. Why you ain't calling it Black anymore? Well, 
you know? We're not doing this because the Asians, but they call this yellow studies. Now I know why we called it black studies, it was a sense of pride. And to be black is to be African. We didn't negate the black studies curriculum, except to the extent that it was outdated. We added to it, we went beyond it. And so to suit the conditions of our time, but also as a reflection of how we thought, which enabled us to define phenomena. In this case, ourselves, you know? So if you define yourself as black, you need to understand what's in black. It's African reworked in America. And yeah, it's got the alienating stuff that comes from slavery that leads you to say, I ain't no African. Like we used to fight over being called black, fight over being called African. What Chinese fights over being called Chinese? But we know why. Had they been uh, put through what we were put through, the furnace of slavery, and in the case of the Caribbean and South America, colonialism, they have a different mentality, I understand. You know? So this was the problem. And for those of us that sought to uh, control the space at San Francisco State and others to control spaces on other university campuses in an empowering way, we had to be clear on our identity. We couldn't play with it, you hear me? And without it, we'd be trapped in the Euro-American Aryan paradigm. We'd be cultural citizens of America. <laughs> so this is not a knock on Carter G. Woodson. He did good for his time, better than most. If, if anybody writes something even close to miseducation of the Negro, well, mighty, mighty, you know what I mean? Uh, very few will or have. So I salute him, but I'm making this point because this is a lingering problem that we would have to address because many of us have the same mentality, you know? Call ourselves black, don't want anything to do with Africa. So um, when I entered the university and um, then as a professor became department leader for 12 years, a position I didn't want, I went to state to teach and organize in the community and do all the other things I do. I didn't want to manage. And I, I'm trained in, my degree is in uh, uh, administration is natural as breathing. I mean, I manage something going to sleep, you know? But I didn't want to do it. But Ray Richardson, who brought me out, gave me a call one day and said, this is what sisters do, you know? Black studies has been good to you. And I said, uh-oh. <laughs> uh-oh. She was chair and she tired of it, gave it up a, a year before she should have and dropped it in my lap. And I said, oh, hell. By the way, chairing is of all the jobs of a department is the worst job you can get because you have a lot of responsibility and no authority. I mean, absolutely none. And in the state university system, you don't even get paid, but I didn't care about that. And therefore most chairs end up with high blood pressure, bleeding ulcers, uh, diabetes. I'm describing people in our department who inherited this. So if you have a certain profile, the stress will do you in. I won't go into how I learned how to handle stress, but my philosophy is you don't stress me, I'll stress you. Whatever stress you're trying to put on me, I'm transferring it to you. I don't take it, but you have to have a certain mentality. I'm not going into that now. So once I got in, I realized this was an important opportunity uh, to create a space because the topic of this is rules for building black power in alien university and black community spaces. In this case, to create 
a vision and power in the space that we occupy. And space is really important. Sun Ra said space is the place. Well, he was talking about the alien stratosphere, but Sun Ra was about creating that here, you know, quite a guy. In fact, he did a fundraiser for us once, which is real nice. He was in the New York Times. Well, a picture of him was in the New York Times. He's an interesting guy, you know, hell of a musician. Uh, so the question was, um, how are we going to control this African, uh, a black space, this African space? How are we going to turn it into a free space so that our students would be free to think for themselves? And so that was our great accomplishment as we controlled our space. I had a good friend, Thomas Goodman, uh, who was a master astrologer and deeply embedded in African history. And he said, the amazing thing you did at San Francisco State is you controlled your space and nobody told you all what to do. <laughs> Darn right. If we can control the space of a whole city, and if I had the chance, I'd know how to do it for the whole country. You know what I mean? A university space, oh, give me a break. But it's all a question of how you think. If you think you can control the phenomena and create it, then you can pretty well control it. So this was the real task. And in an environment that is racist, oppressive, and is used to bowing and scraping to the people who are on top, which in the university is the president. The president is like a corporate head. He pretty well dictates what he does. And presidents pretty much like if they had deans, just firing them just for no prep, no reason at all, you know? Um, boom. Most loyal, butt kicking, kissing uh, deans you had, suddenly their heads fell because the president just felt like doing it. That's called arbitrary power. That's the essence of how white people wield power. You know what I mean? Huh? <laughs> so how do you create a free space in that environment? And no different than the corporate environment. They do the same thing, except they're more powerful. And they run the university, by the way. And the best healed part of a university is the business department and the science department, because they provide the tools for the people that run the country. You know? So what this uh, reality of creating a free space was based on um, was the reality of our situation here. The old people understood this. They had a saying, I'm in America, but I'm not of America. That attitude's very important when you're controlling your own space. As I said, I only knew one white person. And the whole time I was at San Francisco State, Ann Shadwick. She had been the head of the uh, statewide faculty union. Why did I know her? Because she helped me get my promotional file together for a full professor. I mean, I had all the stuff, but you know, you have to know how to arrange it right. So she put the time in. So I appreciated her. I told her I liked her because she's functional. Now, if you're functional, I like you for what you can do. Other than that, there wasn't anything anybody could do for me at state, you know, white. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's a good thing because there are rules for how you maintain your integrity. I'll go into that a little bit later. And uh, wasting too much time with white people is breaking one of the rules. So we'll go into that a little bit later. So um, realizing that we're in this university, but not of it, just as we're in America, but not of it, um, gives you a different perspective uh, that you operate from. But the key to us creating a free space had to do with having a free vision, a vision of where the discipline should go, a, a vision for how we could free our students' minds. And this vision had to transcend, rise above, be qualitatively different, opposed to the demonical vision of the Eurocentric 
worldview and academy. It had to be that. And so the only way you could create this kind of vision is to be able to be constantly in the process of reshaping and transforming yourself to work on your shortcomings and to ascend on the sixfold stages to mental freedom. I hope you note how this baby keeps coming in. You've got to know how these two uh, work together. Uh, so shaping the uh, vision was key uh, for uh, shaping and creating the space uh, in interaction with our community locally, nationally, and internationally. Because all that time we had, it certainly gave me the time to even do more because the first trips I took was to Africa. I mean, I got hired in 72. And in 72, I'm traveling to Africa, you know, three, uh, usually three weeks and one time three months. And I spent more money traveling to Africa than I did on anything else. In fact, if I had bought two or three Victorians, I could have bought two or three Victorians because you get them for 20000 25000 you know. And I bought one for our organization, but uh, I could have done that. But going to Africa was key. That was part of it. And engaging in global struggles as well as local and national. So creating free space meant free visionary intellectual space. This is the first space we're talking about. It's the intellectual, it's the spiritual space. I'm not going to the spiritual space today. I do that when we deal with Africana studies. Um, and so this intellectual space had to rise above that, be an alternative to that of the Euro-American Aryan Academy. Um, if it didn't, what we would have is Oreo cookie studies. We would have uh, the complexion, the color. We'd have all of these different subjects, black sociology, black psychology, black history, and all this stuff. And when you got into it, uh, a lot of it would be white stuff. Even if we're talking about black people, it would be through their perspective, their analytical methods, and a host of other things. So free space uh, is depending upon free thinking. Um, and this meant that we had to constantly push the envelope of the discipline. I'm a revolutionary, and so I'm pushing my own envelope to try and grow, my own thought pattern, my own attitudes, my own philosophy, you know, my own behavior. And the same thing has to happen with the discipline. That's because I came in transitioning between disturbance Black and African identity. And I began to go deeply into the African identity while going deeper into Black culture and Black identity and transcending to revolutionary consciousness, which started in the Black freedom movement. It started when I saw that the corporate structure of America is structured to keep us in the dust and to keep poor people in the dust. And so that was really my teaching ground. Success really taught me the failure. The success of beating the corporations taught me there ain't no beating them ultimately under a corrupt capitalist racist system. So uh, that, that ability to transcend beyond the political economy as well as the culture and other systems um, was what enabled me to see beyond this system. And that was due to a lot of things, self-cultivating work, study, learning from my students, interacting in the community. And then out of that, you grow. And you can only create a free space if you have a free space within yourself, which means you're free yourself. And so there's a certain point where, and when I get into Africana studies, the shift to Africana studies, I'll go into this, where I call the retreat of our faculty this was in 1990, the only retreat I ever had without an agenda to find one thing. What's the shift of the discipline gonna be based on? I won't go into our conclusions there, but we came up with the shift. And then what happens is the Hoover Institute 
and the California State University system comes down on us to destroy us. And by the way, Condoleezza Rice is now in charge of the Hoover Institute. I pointed out before, it's the most powerful of the think tanks in the country in terms of laying out agendas. It laid out 80% of Ronald Reagan's agenda. And so they sat in on 32 of our classes to record our demise. <laughs> And uh, then the CSU system, which the president was operating under, was moving to wipe us out. So we had a two-year wipeout period where they tried to wipe us out, longer than it took to get Black studies during the strike and harder to win. And then at the same time, Leonard Jeffries has attacked New York City College. Malefi Asante has put down his chair for a while at Temple University. He creates the first Africana Studies um, PhD program. And they came after uh, Jacob Carruthers, who's one of our top heavyweights, one of my masters, after his department, Center for Inner City Studies. And so we had that battle going on at the same time. And Phil McGee, uh, who was dean, had backed me in this. And this took a lot of courage because dean served at the will of the president. Phil McGee was... Uh, Practice, practitioner of nebulous dualism. He could grin and mean something else. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he could do that on blacks as well as whites. He was quite skilled at that. And so he had backed me on this. He backed me for two reasons. He said, first, I back you because your stuff's field tested, meaning I've been in a lot of battles. My stuff works. Two, he said, I'm backing you and pushing the envelope, because when you're creating free space, it's got to constantly grow. And um, he said, because disciplines change every 20 years. But we're in the midst of changing and shifting the discipline so that the, the minds of our students could be freer. At the same time, fighting to preserve the department, two front war. And so he wants a break. He said, don't do anything for a week. I'm going to see Naeem Akbar. And Naeem and Phil McGee were buddies. They both went to Ohio State. They were roommates. You know, I told uh, Naeem, because we did a uh, discussion together uh, at a university campus <clears throat> in the 90s. And I said, Naeem, you got the same gestures as Phil. <laughs> He said, tell Phil that. <laughs> That's how much influence Phil had on Naeem. But Naeem's brilliant. So, you know, he went to Naeem to just ask one question. Could I get away with expanding the envelope of the discipline? Because it went well beyond anything the university permitted. I'll go into that when we do the African Studies piece. And so Naeem's brilliant. He asked only one question. I've been asking the same question. You know, he said, how much do you think Shaka can get away with? And I've been asking the same question because anytime I engaged in a battle and when corporations fall and all this shit, I said, I, we did this, but I directed it. I said, ooh, really? How much more can I do? And so Phil came back with that answer. And so my answer was to go as far as I could go. That's what revolutionaries do, to push the discipline to its limits so that our students had unlimited freedom to know themselves, respect themselves, think for themselves, love themselves, and serve their communities. And to do that, you had to love, love them. And that's what I love more than anything was my students, and the reason I'm doing this show is for black people in general. Anyone who's a human being that wants to get this is fine, and especially our youth, especially our youth. If my demographics was all 60 years old, I would shut this show down because I'm just not into just talking to the choir. I like the choir. I like good music, you know? But I like to hear some new music, you know what I mean? and some people who are gonna be playing some new music in the future, our future, the youth, you know? So 
Um, what's interesting is <clears throat> in the midst of this battle, <clears throat> who comes to visit the president of San Francisco State? Skip Gates. <laughs> Dr. Skip Gates. I call him Skippy Gates because he reminds me of peanut butter. Don't get me wrong. I, I like peanut butter. George Washington Carver did a lot with the peanut. And that's one reason I'm healthy. I eat a lot of peanuts. You know what I mean? But Skippy, there's a kind of like getting, you know, kind of like mud getting caught in the the muck. Peanut butter is sticky, you know, Skippy Gates. <laughs> so I send a spy to the president's dinner, you know, to see what's going on here. Because we're midway through this battle. And Skip Gates is an opponent of Afrocentrism, in case you didn't know, you know. And so the person that we sent, Mary Hoover, who I got tenured at San Francisco State, came back. And she said, while they were eating whatever they were eating in between, Skip Gates said he had never heard of Black studies at San Francisco State. <laughs> now, of course he had. Because, you, you know, it's kind of like you saying, you never heard of your mother. We we mothered it so you know about us. You know what I mean? What you mean is, because one of his ways of disempowering people is to go through non-recognition, so he just ignore us. So what he meant is, who heard of who heard of us? You know what I mean? We ain't nothing. You know, I'm not going to say Skip was there to sign off on our destruction, but I think he wouldn't have been sad had we been destroyed because he was carrying out the ideological attack against Leonard Jeffries at the same time, putting a lot of labels on him that Leonard didn't deserve. You've, you've seen him on our show before, brilliant man. He's clear on his identity, you know? So um, this was a sign also that Skip Gates didn't have any problem with what was happening. He didn't come to talk to us. We're in the middle of an attempt to wipe us out. He don't care. You know what I mean? So I refer to Skip Gates because he represents another way in which space is handled on a university. Now, I'm giving you the extreme of the radical space, where you radicalize your space. And by the way, I want to say this. Don't confuse what I mean by radical. I'm talking revolutionary. Revolutionary for African people has got to be grounded in the African worldview. It's got to be grounded in African philosophy, African history, and African-American philosophy and history. It's got to be grounded in the depths of it. Because if you're coming out of a Western radical tradition and you know nothing about this, you have no alternative to the West other than you want to be kind in terms of how you handle the money and economy issues. But because you come out of a alien Western view, your idea of power is no different. Look at how the Russians handled their people. The Chinese are a little different because they're coming out of a Confucian culture, but the Russians Stalin lined up and shot probably more people than Hitler killed, you know, in the name of equally distributing the wealth. There was no equal distribution of power and no redefinition of what it means to be human. Because if any people need a redefinition of that, it's the Aryan or the European, you know what I mean? So don't mistake what I'm saying when I'm talking about revolutionizing a space if you don't have an alternative that comes out of the best of your history, culture, spirituality, politics, social systems, and whatnot, you ain't going to have anything that's different. And you're going to end up oppressing yourself or being oppressed under the same old, same old with a different name. You hear me? So I use Skip Gates to give an illustration of what happens when you occupy uh, a space in the academy with a subservient mentality. <laughs> but I also want to say this about him. He has done a lot. It's a question of what he's done. But he has at least done a lot. 
because in occupying this space, you have a lot of different types that occupy this space. You have the careerist type. Those are the ones who come into the university with their degrees and are only concerned with getting a paycheck. They leave nothing behind them of value. You hear me? They're anti-African, they're anti, some of them black. They're the worst of all, other than the reactionary ones that are on the extreme right wing that shouldn't get into the black studies department, but who knows? But that's all they do, and, and they barely teach. You know what I mean? So the careerists. And you have the lazy types who come in and it's a job. They're a little bit above the level of careers, but they teach the same thing over and over again for their whole life in the academy. And in both cases, have little contact with the community. You know, And there are a lot of other types. So in this particular case, uh, Dr. Skip Gates uh, represents a, a type that occupies space. Um, And again, remember, what you do with the space depends on your philosophy. It depends on your mindset. It depends on how you define and see phenomena, to go back to Brother Huey P. Newton. Uh, so in a recent film that I saw on Gates, because he's putting out a lot of films, so he has been designated by the white power elite as the one who can interpret not only your biology, you know, through tracing your lineage, which was initially done for blacks, and now it's being done for everybody, but to trace your history. He just did a show on Frederick Douglass that greatly distorted his legacy. Um, the one on Malcolm X that said absolutely nothing new and sidelined the foremost scholar because it was on who assassinated Malcolm. And so who are you supposed to have on there? Baba Zak Kondo, the foremost authority, all the authorities on Malcolm. You've seen my show on that. It's one of the best viewed shows, three hours, in-depth, not a single critical comment, you know, criticism of the interview. And it was a harsh interview on who did it. He's put in a side room and interviewed for about four minutes. While the guy that they put up there, Muhammad, whatever, Gave you stuff that everybody already knew Bradley was the hit man. You know what I mean? We already knew that. But he acted like this was his lifelong work. The good thing about that show is that it got one of the alleged assassins clear, you know, because he publicized it so much. But what he did was obscure the real scholarship on Malcolm's assassination and tried to keep hidden, though he's not hidden, uh, the real scholar on it. And the show on Frederick Douglass, I just watched that about a week ago. Nice visuals, you know, nice pictures of him and stuff. Here you have the foremost black abolitionist leader in the history of the United States. You hear me? A person who collaborated with Martin R. Delaney. Being portrayed as um, solely in, in his description, I mean, he, he briefly referred to the fact that he was an abolitionist, but he didn't go through the essential quality of him because he's giving you a summary. So this is his portrayal. And what does he say? Basically, he's, he's a man uh, who is good with words. You know, yes, of course he was. Would somebody say that's all you'd say about Malcolm? Is he was good with words? Is that all you would say about King? Is that he was good with words? You know what I mean? And he fails deliberately to point out that Frederick Douglass defined his most defining moment in life is the moment in which he freed his mind from fear. And that's when he beat the slave breaker, Covey, in a two hour fight, this fight, where he didn't suffer a scratch and Covey was bloody. Why did he leave that out? Because that's a history of resistance. You hear me? So he states in one of the films that he has uh, on himself and various aspects of whatever's black, 
He said when he was admitted to the Ivy League, Yale, he said, this is a great privilege, a great honor. And this is what he said after that. He said, I was entering an education that made me a part of the ruling class. <laughs> really? <laughs> How many blacks who go to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, any of these Ivy League colleges that are based on the slave trade, the profit of the slave trade and whatnot? How many of them are going to be president? We've had one. How many of them are going to be attorney general, which, by the way, doesn't make you a part of the ruling class? You know what I mean? We've had one. You know what I mean? But the majority get a degree and lucky to find work. And in the case of Skip Gates, Skippy Gates, as I call him, uh, Skippy Gates is put in the position of being a primary spokesman for the black establishment. That's the group that controls black people. Not no white ruling class anything. He's funded by them. He's propped up by them. But, you know, that ain't the same thing. And so Skip Gates described his view of his role in the academy as, quote, a first class citizen in the Republic of Western Letters. He's an English professor, okay? So black studies is a secondary mission for him, but the key thing about what he sees as his role in black studies is, and I'm quoting him. Notice I always give facts here. I'm, I'm gonna give facts, not my view. I'll give you my view of them later, but just not my view, facts. So he saw as his major role in black studies, examining the implications of nationalistic eruptions and the politics of identity for the future of American society and culture. In other words, he's there to jump on as um, his partner, uh, Cornel West does, a Malcolm X who he describes as a prophet of rage. Please give me a break, you know what I mean? I mean, if he was, what's wrong with it? But I mean, would we be holding him up high just because he was mad? Now he might have some mad ideas for you, but what makes you mad makes us glad, you know? We like those thoughts that brother El Hodge, Malik El Shabazz was putting forward. You know what I mean? Man my behind, nationalistic eruptions. What did he mean by it? Here's a literature man talking about the black arts movement was nothing, huh? Some of your greatest black artists who went mainstream say they owe their careers, their consciousness to the black arts movement. You know hear I me? Mean? Sister Sonia Sanchez, Amiri Baraka, Askia Mohammed Touré, a host of others, Haki Marabuti, a whole bunch of them. They finance their own movement. It's one of the few black arts movements that grew out of the black freedom, black power, black liberation movement. You're gonna put that down, yeah, because his role, his role is to create a group of subservient students who are manageable and will maintain the system. That is, keep order on the plantation, <laughs> the intellectual plantation. You come down on a Leonard Jeffries, you know what I mean? Uh, who spends more time in Africa than he almost spends in his own bed. I mean, you know, this brother's in Africa so much that I don't know how he pays for it. I don't even know how he even counts it. And his wife is with him, Rosalind, one of the baddest scholars we got. I was honored to have her show up on a show. She just peeped in. I want to get her on the show. Rosalind's bad. Her specialty is African art. Bad. I quote her in the integration track. Some of the best stuff I got in there, I got through what she led me to. So he's basically, along with Cornel West, they have been 
at one point labeled as the dream team. Some of us would call it the nightmare team. You know what I mean? But the dream team that is supposed to create a group of manageable students who are literate and can please white people and um, not do much of anything else. And by the way, Cornell West, I like Cornell West in the sense that he is at least anti-capitalist, anti, he's all the anti. So I think that's good, Cornell. I, I respect that. But he hasn't got an original thought of his own. You know what I mean? And he's smart. Both of these guys are smart. I'm not putting them down. They're not dummies. You know what I mean? And Cornell considers himself radical. But his view of us is, African Americans, the only thing we have really is the black church and jazz. Now, jazz is the highest level of our art form. And the black church, that's the institution we own, and it's contradictory, but it has a strong African foundation, which uh, Skip Gates has distorted in his series on the black church. He has no discussion of how the black church emerged. None of the voices stuff about the black church emerged out of the Obia men and women, the African priest who he intuitively said gave birth to the black church. My research shows that's correct. And not on the plantation after slavery on their own terms. Hmm. So on the one hand, he tries to club us over the head because he's, the, he's a defender of black culture, Skippy Gates and Cornel West. They don't even know what black culture is because if you don't know Africa, you don't know black and you sure don't know black culture because black culture is more African than most blacks even know. And it's pretty when it's integral. So I cite that to say, this is how you misuse your space because you're so happy that all oh, masters, especially in the big house, the big house is Harvard and Yale and all those places. You're in the big house. I mean, the last thing you're going to do is talk about re rearranging some intellectual furniture. You're going to do a footnote, which for Skip Gates is a signifying monkey. That was his great um, introduction to African-American culture. Then we signify. Yes, there is a signifying monkey. What about Br'er Rabbit? And more important, what about High John the Conqueror, who is often Br'er Rabbit? That's the warrior spirit. He's left the warrior spirit completely out. You hear me? Completely out. Even though it's the warriors that got him his job, not at Harvard, but generally in the institution of Black or Africana studies. So this is how you misuse your space. But you get raised up to the heavens. And if you Black and you don't know your stuff, you'll fall for it. But if you're conscious, it'll make your blood boil. I'd love to have a debate with Skippy Gates. I'd love to. I could close my eyes and clean his clock. So Black Studies and later Africana Studies um, at San Francisco State took a radical course to challenge the Western intellectual paradigm. Black Studies and later Africana Studies at other universities and colleges, uh, while not radical, were progressive, and they made major contributions to our intellectual thought. Um, my own, the twin lineal family model, sixfold stages to mental freedom, and the seven pedagogy and some others. Dr. Wade Nobles, his contributions um, to see spirit as the driving force in what has been called the discipline of black psychology, which um, I've joked with him and he already knows this. I said, you know, Wade, you're not any longer a psychologist. He already knows it. I don't know if he's come up with a name for it, but Wade is off deeply into spirit. And he was one of the key reasons that our discipline was so strong at San Francisco State. Dr. Theophil Obinger, who by the way, I, I may have told you this in a previous show, I found out from Leonard Jeffries attending uh, Africa, ASCAD Conference Association for the Study of Classical African Civilization uh, in 1998 in New York, 
where I was supposed to be a plenary speaker and they had me speaking to about 12 people. And I'm saying I wasted my time, except I also came to interview Professor John Henry Clark, the last interview I did for the book on Seba. And, um, and I had dinner at Leonard Jeffries uh, the night before and Marcus Garvey's son was at the dinner. It was an honor to meet him. And Jeffries says, Dr. Theofelo Vinga is looking for a job. Guess what? I'm no longer chair. I'm chairing the hiring committee. And everybody been telling me to hire somebody. I said, uh-uh, I don't see anybody worth hiring. I ain't hiring nobody. Uh-uh. <laughs> so I'm at John Henry Clark's house and um, getting ready to interview him. He's about to transition. He was sleeping a lot. Well, he wasn't sleeping. He was falling off, but very sharp. It was the best interview I got. About three hours on the master in his life. This is his boloso period. Excellent. So I said, John, should we hire Dr. Obinga? It's kind of like asking the physics department, should you hire Einstein? You know what I mean? Or George Washington Carver? Huh? <laughs> what a dumb question. But I, he's my oldest, so I had to ask. He said, yeah, if he wants to. So I call up Wade, I'm giving him all these reasons why we should hire a TFL. He said, I don't need no reasons. Get him out here. <laughs> he's, he's acting chair for one year. You know? He was smart enough to not to stay in there too long. And so you know, two weeks later, he's flying out to my house. He gets to sleep for about three hours. And we had to do a competitive interview, which you, what department is going to have the best in their field applying? And you're going to have a competitive interview. So we went along with it. It was a, I, I wouldn't want to have been one of the people that was competing with him. And we hired him. And then I got him more pay because by then I had um, I had the president doing pretty much what I wanted. I was defining uh, reality and making it conform to our wishes. And so I got him more pay than anybody else. And uh, he stayed at my house for four months and stayed with us for 12 years. So made a major contribution to the discipline, would be constantly off in the community, People in Sacramento who have an African-centered church, well, a church, he'd go up there for five, six, seven weeks, a month, two months, three months, teaching them Meru Netra, going all over the country doing his stuff. You know what I mean? Um, and he was introducing the comedic civilizational model, you know? And I got a lot to learn from him because in, right here where I'm sitting, that's my desk, I do my writing, and behind me is another desk. He was doing his on an old rundown computer, uh, uh, typewriter. He didn't use computers. I don't think he used them to today. So a part of what this discipline did was to put forward those kind of models. And then Marimba Ani with her magnificent work, Yurugu, which describes the white unjust society model. I pointed out this before that in 1995, she and I did a co-presentation to ASCAT, me an hour, her an hour, a thousand people, all our great masters there. John Rooney Clark, afterwards, I called him that Monday and said, what'd you think? He said, I was watching my two replacements. He meant one of 40 because John thought his mind was better than any 40. So he had 40 replacements. Well, it was an honor to be on the list of 40. Remember, Adi's bad. And by the way, she comes out of SNCC. Uh, Donna Richards. Bob Moses' wife got into SNCC during the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project, which was a summer project that could get you killed. Brilliant sister. Uh, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries and her model uh, for African art, Malana Karinga and his Kawaiiti model, and Melina Abdullah, Dr. Melina Abdullah, who, is, uh, who was chair. Uh, at Black Studies California, uh, Los Angeles, um, is the best organizer in Black Lives Matter, subscribes to the Ella Baker group leadership model, where leaders are all over the place, which is uh, what Black Lives Matter is into. But she, being grounded in African history and African politics, knows the root of that. She knows that this comes out of classless age grade societies, hunter gatherer societies. So again, this is a young scholar. I think she, she's secretive on her age. I had to laugh, you know, a radical scholar running around here, not telling your age, but she's gotta be close to 50. A student that I um, interacted with at Berkeley High, when we put 
um, are two courses of introduction of black studies in a program we call Step to College. So kids who, black kids who are going to high school can they get college classes, transfer them um, if they go to college. And she was one of those young people and one that I'm really proud of and is engaged in anti-police violence work and got this last uh, district attorney, black district attorney out of office in LA um, after being threatened at gunpoint by her husband, Melina was bad sister, a lot of respect for her. So this is just part of what uh, the discipline uh, has created. And I would say Melina, I have to ask her how she considers herself. She may well be a revolutionary scholar, uh, revolutionary activist. I suspect she is. You know? That would give me company. <laughs> I'm not interested in doing this by myself. So creating and controlling our intellectual space was the main thing, a free space. And by the way, we got the opposition afraid of us. You know what I mean? After we established our presence against attack, defeated the attack. But the key thing is, uh, this was the result of consciousness and our ability to create uh, program in reality. So space on one level is intellectual space. Um, space on another level is institutional space because you have to have um, space to operate your classes. You have to have space to operate your administrative machinery. You have to have um, institutional space that's funded. And so you also have to be able to maintain enrollment. When I came in as chair, we had hardly ever met target. That's your enrollment target. And when you don't make target, they can start to cut your positions. And so the first thing I did is, as, as a philosopher, I believe everything moves in cycles. As an astrologer, planets move in cycles. History moves in cycles. Uh, life has its own cycles. Every person's life has a pattern. And so I wanted to find out what's the enrollment cycle. And so I pulled all the records. They weren't great. But I figured out what it was, why we weren't making enrollment. Because one of the things about controlling space is you got to be efficient, you know, not Mickey Mouse. So I called all my faculty together. At that time, we did enrollment of students through what's called the problem center. Now it's all computer. And so I told them, my data shows me that we're coming in at 70% of enrollment at problem center. And, and we usually don't come out of that. And so we're usually 10% below our enrollment target. So you got the job of going out here and recruiting students to the point where I want 80% enrollment at my problem center. And then my data shows after that, by osmosis, we'll pick up 20% or more. So in 22 out of 24 semesters, we exceeded target and only one semester did we make target. We exceeded it. That means we're entitled to money. That means we're entitled to uh, faculty positions. You know what I mean? So being efficient was key in the space. That's important. But the key thing is when you establish a space that transcends the system, you have to be able to defend that space and you have to be able to defeat all comers. And during my time, I faced three big attacks. The biggest one was the two-year attack coming from the Hoover Institution, but there were others as well. One, that you couldn't win with a fight. You had to win with the perfect strategy, and we won all of them. Now, here's the key thing about this, and this is a philosophy that I carry anywhere, and this was just the philosophy in defending a space in the academy, but that was a philosophy in the streets. This is a philosophy. In battle, treat your enemies with respect. Number one, by knowing them. That's how you defeat them. But in defeat, be magnanimous. Don't be going around here with all this name calling. And in battle, I never use names. Unless it would give me a victory, and I never had to. Hannibal would do that. 
because he wanted to provoke an enemy that was unstable. I never found that it was going to be beneficial. But the key thing is, in victory, you're magnanimous. You're generous. Why? One, it's our nature. That's my nature. I don't carry around grievance. You know, I'm not running around here angry about this and angry about that. You know, I don't have no stress level, no high blood pressure. I cause it. I don't have it. And so in, in the case of San Francisco State, it was the same thing with the corporations, all the various forces we faced and the forces I faced in different battles. I'm magnanimous for a policy reason. You were my enemy. Now you're going to work for me. That was Huey Newton's thing about, you know, power is this ability to define phenomenon and to get it to act accordingly. Well, the acting accordingly is according to your, 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 your will. And so um, I don't gloat over a victory. Maybe privately, I might celebrate it, maybe, but not publicly. And no name calling, because people will often remember a name, a slight, more than anything else. Because now your job is to serve our interests. And so when we defeated the efforts to destroy us, I told the, the, the dean for two years, I want the president to my house. White people don't come to my house. You understand? Except if it's PG&E, that's the electric company. <laughs> I'm not in, you, you ain't coming into my space unless you got some good vibes. I ain't got no good vibes with any of them. You know what I mean? But I wanted him there. And we finally got him there two years later. And I got so many goodies, it was funny. A master's in ethnic studies, but a joint appointment for a sister named Ruth Love, who had been superintendent of Chicago and Oakland schools looking for a job at state. I was going to hire her. President didn't know it. So he gave me a line half in our department, half in education. We got a whole lot of stuff. And I made sure that meeting, because it was the college meeting, I made sure my meeting was an hour early so I could get the goodies. So that's part of defending your space. The other thing I want to say about defending your space is wherever you are, and in this case, in university, but this is true of community organizations. The best defense of a space, whatever it is, let's state political organization, Black Panther Party, let's say, um, or in the case of the academy, Black or Africana studies, the best protection in defense is a good position. Now, in war, it's usually geography, high terrain, you know. In political groups, like the Black Panther Party, it's how you position yourself in the very beginning. Good positioning will often ward off attacks. I'm going to give you the example. You had the Black Panther Party for self-defense. They came under heavy state attack. But you had the deacons for self-defense that didn't. Why? Their positioning was much better. They weren't fat-mouthing. Fat-mouthing is usually not good for positioning. We who are insecure love it off the pigs and stuff like that. Oh, we love it. It brought in the shock troops from the streets. But it ain't smart. You hear me? It's not smart. And the deacons, the FBI, couldn't get into them. I pointed this out a couple of weeks ago. Um, Akinyele Omoja, who wrote the book on self-defense, um, made the point that the FBI didn't have anything in the file on the deacons because the deacons didn't talk in any circumstances where they could get anything. And when the deacons came into power, it was the Klan that wasn't around because the deacons not only could shoot, but would shoot. And they would do it under circumstances where it was clean. You hear me? You got a guy like Chili Willie, <laughs> huh? <laughs> you got to be pretty bad. You know what I mean? The deacons, you know what I mean? So positioning. So in departments, Africana, Black studies, what's the positioning? Take the solid intellectual positions. Don't take any positions that they can attack you on. Not because you can be attacked, but because you're pursuing the truth. You hear me? I'm going to give you an example here. Bad position. It's one of two times I criticized my master, Professor John Henry Clark. One of two times. He was humble. And I, I never did before. And I'm I'm apprenticing, you know, you usually don't do that, but this was he wrote the introduction to um 
Iceman Inheritance, Michael Bradley's book. I, I had, I already knew the essence of where he was coming from and I knew what he was doing. This, this was a guy who claimed to be part Native American who was really covering Shake on a Deops Two Cradle Theory. Ice Man Inheritance is kind of like his uh, position on that. And I, I refused to put any money into the book, but I was speaking in Yakima, Washington uh, at the very time in which Jesse Jackson was running for president, Black United Front was supporting him. And so I stayed at a place that was an African village that I helped get funded in the 70s. And a sister named Rojo, her husband, Fundi, older people, I named both of them. And so I'm staying in the house and then I'm going to speak at a local college. And so Iceman Inheritance is there. So I read it and threw it back on the floor where I found it full of crap. So I told John Henry Clark, I said, you should have never written an introduction to that book. That book is laden with BS, pure bunk. You know what I mean? Pure bunk. And that was one of the positions that they used to attack us. So you don't put yourself in a position. In the case of John Henry Clark, great scholar, they couldn't really attack him. But there were some other scholars that took this position. They used this to take them out, take their department out by taking positions you really shouldn't be advocating and you cannot defend in the light of day. You know what I mean? So you got to, so the best position is the best you can do. The best intellectual work, the best organizing work. That's how you defend yourself. And then when, it, when the attack comes, your support will come. And that's your community. So this was a uh, key, being able to defend the space. And because we're an oppositional department, they're going to be coming after us. But I'm going to tell you, they get rid of departments who are just lackey, bootlicking, you know, departments because they don't want you there anyway. You know what I mean? And who knows what future Skip Gates has. But it seems like he's serving their interests quite well. So... Um, this is what's called war. As Mao Zedong said, um, war is politics with bloodshed. Politics is war without bloodshed. And so when you're defending space, that's a political act. And um, you've got to defend it appropriately on solid ground, standing on the truth. Now, the classroom. In building a free space, on the university campus, this is something we didn't know going in, but um, it was important that you learn this and that you adhere to this. The first rule for a professor is this. The classroom is like the sea or the ocean for fish. It serves the same role the ocean for fish, as the community does for scholarship and for our students. Because as Dr. Nathan Hare said, the community is the classroom. And so the biggest mistake professors can make who have been active in struggle is to disengage from the community. Because then what happens is you no longer have a river to swim in, you're standing in stagnant water. You become stagnant because you're not in the flow of your community. And while you may come in with some very good ideas, you'll be outdated in short time. And then if you make another mistake of putting most of your time into community life, serving on too many committees and all the rest of that stuff, then you're isolated again from reality for another reason either because you want to get promoted or because you're institutionalized. I'm not saying you shouldn't serve on any. You need to serve on some to pr protect your department. But your main emphasis should be in the community. My rule as a, a professor was I teached and taught and went into the community and organized. As I pointed out last week, for years my students suffered from office hours. I didn't have any. My office hours was my house. Call me, I'll give you whatever advice I can. You know, 
Later, I did office hours, but I still did mostly teach and go into the community, you know, and that community was local, national, and international, you know. Uh, so um, to be relevant, good scholars have to be immersed in the realities that surround them, and that's in their community and in the students who come into their classroom who have a lot to teach. So my objective when I came into the classroom was to radicalize my students. And I've said this before the last show I did that I, I have a mantra, very few things I've repeated, but I tell them the FBI, CIA, was dumb enough to let me teach here. I'm smart enough to radicalize your black behind. Now, they weren't dumb enough to let me be there. They got defeated, but it sounded better to put it that way. Um, so my objective was to radicalize um, my students through teaching a curriculum of political resistance, a curriculum of empowerment, through looking at African history and always applying the past to the present, present and looking at what can you use from the past to transform your present condition. Of all the classes I taught in which I taught politics, history, Malcolm X, um, philosophy, and both African and African-American history, of all the courses I taught, the most important was African philosophy because and African-American. And I included in it after a while, European philosophy only so that people could understand um, what it was. And we're not talking about the philosophy of racism. That's easy. I'm talking about their worldview that most of us don't know. We know white supremacy. We don't know the European worldview. And they were oppressing people on the planet before they ever got the racist mentality. And so I ended up eventually including that as a subject matter. And my students would come up to me and tell me, well, yeah, this is good because I can see how this is messing with me. So they understood better <clears throat> how to, you know, get this out of them. But the key reason that African philosophy was central is that it provides the deep thought of our culture, both African and African-American. And it is the way that we get our students to see through their own eyes. And so that's the whole objective with students is to create a free space where they can see themselves as they are and be empowered to use their brilliance to go into the community and work in the community to revitalize it, working with black folks, not coming in as leaders. So, Viewing the community as the classroom, part of the teaching projects were community projects. So um, in my show last week, one of the people who had been a student of mine years ago was making the comment that she was a part of the research project on the San Francisco state strike. And that was the only study of the strike done by a black scholar where he went in and interviewed all the leaders, you know, in the 80s. And so that was a project. Um, or um, one project was to give students class credit for uh, joining a campaign to fight to see that the building that I and Jim Montgomery had built, the Marcus Garvey, Martin Luther King uh, cooperatives, um, didn't go through a refinancing because HUD and the rest of them were trying to get them to do that because they were on the verge of owning those units. So we had students uh, involved uh, in that campaign. Uh, we did all kinds. I would use uh, students to also survey the mind of the black community. And so, for example, the Jim Jones thing that went down, what was behind that? And looking at liberation movements and whatnot. So they did a lot of detailed work, but mainly to encourage them to um, get involved in the black community, engage themselves in some kind of way, join an organization and take part in the forward liberation of uh, African students. 
And so the free space that we were creating was most importantly a free space to enable students to transcend the limitations of Eurocentric thought. The purpose of pushing the Africana studies discipline outside the Eurocentric box was to free our students to see another world. One of my students said recently, it was a, a comment they sent me that this was the first time she got to think and see beyond the walls of the university, meaning beyond their view of the world, you know? And the fact that she could say that meant that it was effective because not all students got that message, but that was the point of creating this free space, which is a free space to free the mind so you could free the behind. So African philosophy, again, was a course that enabled you to um, transcend their philosophy with your own and to recondition your mindset, you know? But that would not be completed until students made the decision to join their community and struggle because the sixfold stages to mental freedom only works when it's a 24 seven thing. One of my best students who's a leader in the Pan-African People's Organization, Thabiti M. Tambuzi, who's really played the major role in this organization calls this immersion, meaning that if you're gonna transform um, your vision, transcend that of the society, you have to be immersed in a 24 seven transformation. That's how Malcolm transformed his, in prison and then afterwards, you know? And so that was the key thing. So those of our students who got engaged in the community, those are the ones that would experience the greatest free the mind uh, process. Um, so COINTELPRO, the project was to keep me and others like me out of the classroom. My objective was to recruit my best students. I have a rule. You gotta be smart and have good character. And if you have those two things, I'm fine. That's the same thing with my lady. She gotta have other qualities, you know, personal relationship, but that's a key thing. Huh? And that's challenging. You got people always challenging you. Well, that's good because then what ends up happening is you check yourself out, but you also have people who are able as they grow to make major contributions to community transformation. And so this was the objective that COINTELPRO wanted to prevent. And this is the one that I relish the most. <laughs> Finding those real good students and putting the mojo on them and getting them engaged. And then that was through, and this is something that all um, people who are doing the intellectual work may not do uh, because they may do it in different ways. Dr. Wade Nobles had his own institute for black family life and culture where his research was done and he kept himself grounded. And so different, uh, Dr. Jacob Carruthers had what he called the Comedic Institute where um, he dealt with um, passing on the knowledge of Meru Netcher and other Comedic learning uh, to members in the Chicago black community. So that was his way. Um, and so different, uh, professors who are trying to deal with this alternative, this African-centered view, uh, have their ways. And so mine was uh, through building an organization that was the um, next phase after CORE. In CORE, we had mass move movement. You know, we took out a city economically and whatnot. But I was apprenticing under Garvey. And from Garvey, I learned institution building and power in America and in the world is institutional. And so um, just as I moved to get core Congress of Racial Equality to move to self-reliance, got it in a convention and it was overturned. When I formed Pan-African People's Organization, I went to black businesses, black uh, social clubs, black civil rights groups, 
black community organizations, our black bookstore, and I got them to finance Poplar. You know, I wanted to prove the black community would finance its own movement. And this is the uh, only time I've taken money in the black community. It wasn't a lot, but it was a, a salary for a year for myself and a secretary, a sister named Ethel Jones. She had been in core before. So the group we formed, Pan-African People's Organization, has been in operation since 1966. So students I recruited helped in that organization. People I recruited on the streets, because the other danger is if you limit you're recruiting only to the college, you're gonna have a certain kind of organization. You have to have a strong grassroots base in your community. And so we built up uh, this institution, Pan-African People's Organization. One of the first rules just is on the campus when you're building your space, you have institutional space. Well, here, an institution needs housing. That usually is a building that you own not rent, you know? So we bought a 5,800 square foot Victorian for $36,000. I put the down payment on it, half of it, when I'm making $800 a month. But I had a way of getting the money. So that's a whole nother story. But the key point is that became the headquarters that we called the Malcolm X Unity House and a, a large room that would seat about 300 people Marcus Garvey Hall, with a big picture of Garvey up there. My two first masters, Garvey my first, Malcolm my second. And so people coming into Pan-African People's Organization, coming out of my classroom, went through a 24-7 immersion experience in the six-fold stages to mental freedom because I'm building up a cadre organization. We train them in martial arts. We train them in different things. Um, but they had to be solidly rooted in African and African-American identity, African and African-American culture. And um, by engaging in the projects that we carried out 24 seven, um, that was a part of them freeing their minds. And that was key to agent prevention. Um, I'm trained, I train myself in counterintelligence and stuff. I'm a warrior. To me, it's a game. It's a life and death game. And, uh, but then by having smart people who are conscious and dedicated, they're your greatest wall to penetration. And so I said that one of the attempts of the CIA, FBI was low intensity. In my book, The Art of Leadership, I explain it. Had I not had the classroom of the international community, that is the classroom of the UK, the United Kingdom, which I began to work and organize then after the Sixth Pan-African Congress in 1973. Um, I then began to work with this group in the United Kingdom and picked up a book called, and I mentioned this before, Low Intensity and Peacekeeping Operations by General Kitson. And I studied low intensity. Then I studied how Ronald Reagan had adapted it to the US as governor of California. Then he had, how he brought it to the White House. And so when they tried to penetrate us, I saw it right away. Because with low intensity, if you don't get it right away, your group is finished. And when it's finished, because it's low intensity, the community is not even going to know how it was. You know, they, they may know, as the Simeonese Liberation Army knew, they were burned alive. But why? How? They're not going to know. You know? So... That was a classroom for me, again, the classroom. But for the people that I recruited, the immersion in day-to-day -day struggle. Um, so what did that include? Food program that fed over 25,000 plates of food, 25 cents a meal. Danny Glover said, kept his family alive for two years. Former striker, uh, free clothes. The food program was called Ujama Na Chakula, which meant sharing through the family, Swahili. Um, we set up an independent black school that was organized through a movement to set it up, a year of planning, uh, community members, family members, teachers, students. 
And then I trained people to go into the public schools and recruit 4,000 black students. And we rented public school buses <laughs> and got them to walk out, 4,000 black students, high school students, um, to support the formation of an independent black school. And uh, it still operates. And you owe the operation to Thabiti M. Tambuzi, one of my former students, um, former um, straight A student coming out of high school um, in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and then come up here. And Stadi Kadiria, I mentioned him before, who's both a printer, a mechanic, and a mathematician. Trained by another member of our group who was a master mathematics teacher, Bomani Siwatu, whose husband and wife I married. By the way, I took out a little license so I could marry people because this Pan African People's Organization, total thing. You know what I mean? Um, Papo uh, fought against police violence uh, and confronted the police, as I've mentioned once before on the streets. Um, we operated and continue to operate support groups for Africa. Right now, Dabidi himself manages a, uh, a uh, hostel in Zanzibar on the ocean. You know, people can go to and rest. And for a good six years, we ran African Liberation Day in the 70s, the largest in the States other than the first one in D.C., averaging 25 to 30,000 people and bringing out uh, people like CLR James, John Henry Clark, um, Gil Scott Heron. That was really a beautiful one. Um, and others. We published a newspaper, The African Awakener, and I got a printing press so we could print our own newspaper. Um, and we were primary in organizing the National Black United Front and a whole lot of other work. So for me, the classroom provided great organizing opportunities with beautiful people. So in conclusion, these are some of the rules for building black power in alien university and black community spaces. These are prescriptions for successfully building black power in spaces where we're not supposed to have any power, let alone black power. In many ways, these examples of building black power in a society where we are not of it is an example of how we can do it in the larger society, which we did in the San Francisco Freedom Movement, which groups like Black Lives Matter have done in their ways of addressing police violence that we need to take to higher and higher levels. At a time when the demographic shift is occurring in this country, and by 2044, 2045, you're gonna be a majority. You need not only short-term actions for building power, but long-term actions for restructuring this society, a conclusion that both King and Malcolm reached. And if you do a careful look, you may reach. And that's by taking the best of Africa and the best of new African culture and reworking it in this environment. So I hope you got something out of this. The topic for today was rules for building black power in alien university and black community spaces. I encourage people that haven't subscribed to subscribe to the show. I'm, I hope by next week to have a little thing up on the screen so that you can donate because I put a good 25,000 out of my pocket into this show. I was counting. This is the 70th, 70th show that we've done, 70th. So uh, we're going to need some help because there's some things we need to grow the show that will take a little money. And you notice I have no advertisers. I'd rather not have them. I've been fighting corporations all my life. I'm not interested in promoting them. So give me a little help. It won't go into my pocket. It'll go into the pocket of the show. You know? So. Just as we created free space on the campus, this is free space on the Afronet, as opposed to the Ignornet. You hear me? <laughs>
this is a space where you can go to and get some alternative stuff and then share with me your ideas. And if you got some things that you want done, let me know. If it makes sense, we'll do it. I'm open, you know? So I hope you got something out of this. I I, I enjoyed even dreaming this title up. I said, oh, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Hotep. Let's go to any kind of comments or questions or anything else. Thank you, Michael Mayberry and Robin, who is one of the strong sisters who's supporting this show. MD Madhouse Davis, thank you again. Sylvia, uh, thank you. And uh, she said, Sylvia Stewart, tell us how we can share in the financial resources, I will. Hopefully I can have this up on the screen next week. Um, Addis Agarwa, question. Ronald Reagan used low intensity uh, welfare in the White House. What? Yeah. <laughs> is that a question? Yeah, the question is, um, he put it in Homeland Security. That's where it was put. And what happened is uh, Reagan refined low intensity operations that was developed by the British as their advice to um, their children because they have a special relationship. So Kitson, who had, I pointed this out before, Kitson was a brigadier general in the British army. He defeated the Mau Mau's in Kenya, the Malaysian independence movement, and fought the Irish independence movement. So he took a leave of absence from the military and wrote this book, Low Intensity and Peacekeeping Operations. I always look at stuff where practitioners who've been effective, even though it's dirty what they did, if they've been effective, I figure that their stuff is going to be the model for other stuff. So this was really an alternative to the COINTELPRO type of model. And it was also designed to help the American general staff win in Vietnam, which they couldn't do. Um, and so Reagan, when he's in uh, office as governor of California, uh, he has a National Guardsman who refines this low intensity operations for the United States. So he racializes it. So you can bring in how you uh, dismantle different groups and play one group off against the other. Whereas the British didn't have that so much as a problem. Um, and it was put under um, Homeland Security uh, so that it would uh, be disguised under disaster relief and stuff like that. But it was a special unit. All I'm going to say here is low intensity operations um, operates on an invisible level. Its objective is to prevent movements from becoming large. But at each stage, it has a strategy for each stage. You know. Okay, let's see. If Yeah, this is Black Voltron Reloaded. The deacons were very disciplined and practiced operational security of the fullest. Very true. And they're Southern Blacks. And the best Blacks to come out of this country are Southern Blacks. They're more grounded in African culture. They're slave mentalities that can be pretty deep. There are a lot of negatives, but by and large, more integrity, more spirituality, um, and when they're into something like that, they're very serious because you're living in these Ku Klux Klan infested areas. So you just can't be playing around. So, you know, yeah. And, and you know, they had defined missions, defined objectives. They weren't on TV running their mouth. That's not good positioning. Lao Tzu, question, Dr. Shashaka, side note. Did Skip Gates not have a moment of truth, almost disturbance when he... Uh, was accused at his home by a police officer. Yeah, really. It hasn't stopped him in anything he's done. Yeah, of course, but it wasn't a serious disturbance, you know. I mean, he didn't get shot or anything, and he got a beer summit with the president. Who in the hell has a summit with a cop? Who is Who arrested you for going into your own house? That's how insecure they were. They did not want to offend the police unions. 
who came up aggressively saying, you can't say this about our cops. Tell them to go to hell. You know what I mean? Tell them to go to hell. So I don't think if he did, it was momentary, you know. Afia Zakia, amazing history, Baba. Ascot, Ascot and AHSA are the spaces you speak of now. Albinga, Clark, Jeffries, Carruthers, always together, leading Africana studies development. You're darn right. Very creative. And my master among these was Dr. Jacob Carruthers and uh, John Henry Clark. Those were my masters. The others are my colleagues, you know. And Dr. Jake from Chicago, one of the best. Him and uh, Obinga, they were the two best on ancient Kemet. And when Jake left the scene, then Obinga owned the space on his own. And they were very close, those two. <laughs> Black Voltron reloaded. Skip Gates got his meritorious manumission from his white daddy. <laughs> I think his daddy was black. Uh, I think, but if he was, tell me different. But uh, I hear what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, it was a manumission on a freedom on certain terms. Keep those other blacks in check. Question, loud to zoo. Once the vision was created, how was community buy-in achieved? In addition, was the vision created through consensus? Well, the first, in the major shaping of the discipline shift, um, the biggest buy-in was with students. And what I did is uh, call in all our students. We had 800, 1,000 to put forward to them as we did the discipline shift to carry it to a higher level. What did they think and what was their input? So uh, it wasn't just a buy-in, it was a feed-in. And so they had major say-so. Um, community buy-in came in different ways. And by the way, it was consensus, though it wasn't the rule that it had to be. It wasn't anything we had to vote on. We were giving them where we were going, we're under fire, they knew it. And uh, what did they think? They gave us their thoughts, they bought into this, they liked it. You know. It was stuff they were already getting in the classroom. And they saw the need for it in the community, which was undergoing breakdown at that point, because this was in the early 90s. Um, community buy-in came in different ways. So for example, uh, when we're shaping the discipline shift, a uh, team that I hired at the recommendation of another faculty member um, was uh, J. Alfred Smith, Jr. and Sr. Uh, senior was pastor and junior was co-pastor of Allen Temple uh, Church, Baptist Church. It's one of the best black churches in the country. They build all kinds of housing for the black community. They have a black family life center patterned after a family life center put together uh, in Louisville, Kentucky by Dr. Kevin, Reverend, Dr. Reverend Kevin Cosby, a friend of mine, uh, who runs a 15,000 member church, St. Stephen's Baptist Church. So they're all over the community doing stuff. J. Alfred Smith Jr. was a major influence on me, um, strengthening my book, The Art of Leadership, Volume 2, on the section on the Black Church. So that was a big part of the Black community feeding into certain components in the shift, because our shift wasn't just Africa, it was Afro-America. And that's a mistake of Africana studies. It's just often just dealing with Africa. And that's part of the reason why you have trouble selling it in the black community. Other ways we had buy-ins from the community is when um, the Hoover Institute came down to wipe us out. I was fighting now a war on two fronts. One is to redefine the discipline. The other is to beat back the attack. And so I took off one semester from shifting the discipline to organizing the community and put together 150 community organizations. 
And so that was their buy-in. And when they went into the president's office, led by the ILWU, International Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union, the most radical of the unions in the United States my father was a member of, and Ella Hill Hutch, who uh, was the mother of San Francisco Freedom Movement, uh, was a receptionist at. And so their buy-in came on them standing on the line and defending the discipline shift. And when they're leaving the president's office, the head of the ILWU, then not the head, but a major black leader in the ILWU, said, by the way, as they're going out, don't you touch this African-centered discipline. It's valuable to the community. <laughs> I won't go into why I organize this group. You obviously need the community for your support, but I knew my enemy. I knew that this particular president was susceptible to certain kinds of pressures. Know your enemy, know what they want, and know how you can deny it. You know what I mean? So that was part of that strategy. So yeah, the community bought in. They supported us, you know. Uh, Quadro Dieterville, glad to see you, brother. In the early 90s, Skip Gates wrote his hit pieces in the New York Times maligning Dr. Joseph ben Yakinen and Dr. John Henry Clark. He's an overseer. Yeah, he, he kind of referred to uh, Dr. Clark as the head of the mafia. He had a term that they used for mafia heads in describing him. You know what I mean? Um, I'm going to tell you something about Professor Clark. In 19, let's see, when was this? 1996, a year after the Million Man March. The year before, John Henry Clark and I spoke in London with my first wife. That was his last time to speak abroad. His health was declining. And so the following year, we have an ASCAT, Association of the Study of Classical African Civilization in Ghana. And so I flew there to speak. John Henry Clark couldn't come because his health was declining. He had a couple of years left. And so he sent a message, and I'm pretty sure it was uh, Greg Kamantha Carr, who is real strong on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and all these different platforms, a brilliant African, African-American scholar. So he read John Henry Clark's letter. Now this was a short letter, maybe five pages. He cited so many sources I have never heard of. You hear me? John had read so much that it's almost unbelievable. I had a library, 25,000 books, and had read all of them and more, you know? So, uh, Skip Gates might look down from his nose at a John Henry Clark because John Henry Clark didn't go to Harvard or didn't go to Yale. But John Henry Clark said of his education under masters, he said, it was a better education than you could get at the university. And this is one reason he said, because you didn't have to unlearn anything. <laughs> huh. Uh, Chancellor Williams had to unlearn. I had to unlearn. Most of us who've gone through this Western education had to unlearn and relearn. You know what I mean? John didn't have to do that. His university was the masters in his community. So, yeah, that was that was their assignment. Their assignment was to try and make us look crazy and to give cover for taking us out. You know what I mean? Taking us out, destroying us. Lady K. Mosley, how you doing, lady? Fear keeps most complacent and docile. Yes, and you've heard my story on fear. It's an illusion, but it is a good illusion to use. Please believe me. I don't intentionally scare people, but basically the word at San Francisco State was shock was coming. Oh, everybody was peeing in their pants. I don't know why. I didn't know army. You know what I mean? But fear is a good thing to drop on your enemy because he gets dis compodulated, you know what I mean? He don't act right, but it's 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 an illusion. Yeah, it puts you under control, you know what I mean? You weren't born in it, you were taught it. Lao Tzu, um, Dr. Shashaka, I love your reflections on the strength and weaknesses of Carter G. Woodson's work. How do we add your assessments to our community pool of knowledge and build on it? Uh, by supporting this show, 
Lao Tzu is one of those who's volunteered to uh, play a role in the chat. And Brother uh, Ogawa is helping build our platforms. We've had a slight growth in um, the subscribers, and it's due largely to this work um, because the algorithms of Facebook, YouTube work against us, unless, of course, we start to really bring in money for them or something. They don't like my message. I know. I'm doing what I did it. You know, university and community is another space. Radicalize it. So uh, what you can do is recruit people to support this show um, and um, sign up for the six bold stages to mental freedom. Because while some of you are really mentally free and got all kinds of stuff and uh, Lady Kay Mosley and her husband are way ahead. I mean, way ahead. By the way, I like that. I like that uh, Fred Hampton gun club thing you're in, sister. <laughs> Bad, you know? So, um, yeah, encourage people to watch it, uh, but to subscribe. That's the key thing, to subscribe. Um, and um, as I said before, in addition to the books I'm writing, um, these shows, I'm going to probably put some of them in book form. So this will add more uh, to that. LaShonda Henderson, how you doing, lady? Well, thank you for being interested and share your wisdom as well. Cosmic Unloaded, a.k.a. Lady Soul, right on. Life-transforming information. Thank you. That's why I'm doing this. It's work, but I'm enjoying it, and I enjoy you, you know. This is for you. Lao to Zoo, when can we expect the book seven in print? Now, if I wasn't doing this show, it would probably already be done, but I'm not going to blame the show. Um, I'm at a point now where I'm at 600, I think, 43 pages. Um, I'm getting ready to do Amilcar Cabral's Boloso, which is the improvisational phase. I've already finished John Henry Clark's Theofelo Binga, um, Ella Baker, um, a few others. And so when I'm finished with Amilcar Cabral, I, I finished also uh, John Coltrane. Uh, when I'm finished with Emil Carr Cabral, I have to do myself. This is this is where I'm taking masters and showing how they developed from the formative stage, which is what John Henry Clark called it. But in the system, it's called the imitative or in the Dogon system, Jiri So and Benny So stage to the highest level. And so once I'm finished with these two, then I'll be going into Sodaya, which is innovation uh, in the African-American system. And it's called the clear word in the Dogon system. These are the same. Um, and when, so five of the six masters fit the Sodaya level. So once I'm finished with that, then it's application. So then I'm going to take um, how uh, the mastery system um, and the Seba system, because the, the mastery system is the uh, system of the degrees of transformation that people who are on a master's track go through. And the Seba system is the basic system for really teaching uh, that frees those who are being taught. So these are two parallel systems. Um, so once I'm finished with that, then I have earmarked people who are masters in different domains, and I'll be interviewing them. I haven't done this yet. And so you've had a sister on my show uh, before um, who uh, is a revolutionary sister, uh, Kuji Chagalia, one fine sister too. Have <laughs> you seen her? <laughs> one of my former students. She met her husband in my African philosophy class, and she has two daughters just as pretty as her. Uh, they're in the reparations group in COBRA. Uh, so I'll be interviewing her on her approaches to teaching in prisons. She put 20 years into that. And so I'll be looking at application of these two systems into prisons, um, 
into liberation organizations, usually teaching methods is only confined to the classroom, um, into the classroom, into families, uh, into spiritual institutions, and obviously the person themselves. So um, this is, uh, I'm a systems person. I didn't never intended to do that. It's just what my ideas end up being. They're replacement systems for this system. We're going to set up our own society. It's got to be based on just systems. And so that's what this is for. But this isn't just for 50 years from now. It's right now. It's stuff you can use right now. And we are using right now. So when is that going to be complete? When it's completed. <laughs> okay. Christopher Sompel. I defy anyone now who wouldn't wish that a caliber of president we had in Obama were in office right now, even some who didn't like support him back then. Yeah, but I'm going to tell you something. He was all right as a person who had good character personally. Now, when you're president, there's some things you do that aren't good. But my biggest fault with Obama is that when he had power, he didn't wield it. And <clears throat> what do I mean? He had the House and the Senate. He had a well over a majority, so he could do what he wanted. He had a crisis. This is what makes a great president, crisis. Roosevelt had the Depression. Lincoln had the Civil War. Johnson had the Black Freedom Movement. But for the war in Vietnam, Johnson would have been the third best president because of what he got through legislatively, largely through our movement, but also through other things, you know? Vietnam War knocked him off track. But why? Why did he achieve? Why did uh, particularly Roosevelt achieve? Because when they had the power, they wielded it. And in the case of Obama, he had the power. And instead of just focusing on health care, which it's possible that he could have got full health care through, but whether he could or not, he could have dealt with the economy. He could have really done some rebuilding of infrastructure like they're talking about right now. He could have saved black and poor homeowners. We lost 40% of our housing under him because the reserve money he had to save people in that position, he didn't use and later said it was a mistake. It wasn't a mistake. He, he was tiptoeing through the tulips doing the middle of the road stuff. So I don't know a lot of black people don't want to hear this, but I said it at the time, not later. And most blacks were telling me, oh, no, he couldn't do it. White supremacy tied his arm, blah, blah, blah. Guess what? In the first time in a long time, he had the corporations on their knees. They had put him in office along with the black vote, 97%, and the others that supported him. But they gave him the funding to run, right? But this is one time you can bite the hand that feeds you when the hand that feeds you is now coming to you to be fed. You hear me? In Britain, they made conditions on their loans to big business. Here, they just gave it to them. So I'm saying, um, yeah, better than Biden. But Biden at least is in there because we put him in there. So don't forget that. Don't forget it. Um, and if he's halfway good because he worked under Obama, yes. And I, I like him personally. He's born on my birthday. He's got nice qualities as a human being. I mean, but droning people wasn't exactly nice. And he loved droning. So all I'm saying is he had the opportunity to do much better and didn't. Krista Sompel, after reading Drs. Ben Clark, a lot of Dr. Finch, I feel like writing a letter to Penn State asking for a refund for a degree I paid for but wasn't complete. You got it right. And uh, I uh, failed to mention Dr. Finch when I was talking about the great ones. I didn't mention all of them because I didn't have time, but Dr. Finch's Star of Deep Beginnings is a masterwork. 
real masterwork. And what he did with that is take astrophysics and break it down so the average person could understand it and show how it uh, was connected to Dogon astrophysics, master work. And the guy's also uh, MD, you know what I mean? And he's also a spiritualist. Got a nice daughter who helps him out with the work he does. Good brother, you know. And was a part of the welcoming party um, and the group that brought Sheikh Anna Diop to the U.S. and Atlanta. Uh, Christopher Sompel, um, is there a list of books uh, you have written? Uh, yeah, and if you go to the click-in part, when you get out of this show, you'll see a click-in for buying books. The books that are for sale right now that you can buy uh, on Gumroad um, are The Art of Leadership, Volume 1, Return to the African Mother Principle of Male and Female Equality, uh, and the Integration Trap, Generation Gap, caused by a choice between two cultures. So if you click in there, and then there's a few DVDs that you can download into your phone. So you can buy those directly. Part of the reason I'm doing this show, it's a secondary reason, is that I want to have a way to get my writings directly to people. Um, and then the other two books that I've written, The Art of Leadership, Volume 2, and The Political Legacy of Malcolm X, they're out of print right now, but they'll come back. And then I've written a series of articles in various journals um, and stuff. So, yeah, those are my writings. Um, Lao Tzu. Uh, okay, Lao Tzu is saying that he's going to post this show, or at least uh, the topic, on... Um, a link. He's going to have a link for this show on uh, We Change Colonialism page. He said apparently this is a question they're dealing with. Christopher Sompa, he's just reading Miseducation of the Negro. Yeah, great book. Great book. And think, those were newspaper articles. I'm going to do that with some of these uh, discussions we have here and turn these into book form. Brother Shabazz, uh, Christopher Sompel, support is not very important for SCOTUS. Uh, it's a lifetime appointment. Pretty sure most black folks support you know, talking about the Supreme Court justice. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying she's going to do everything we're going to like. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is she's got depth and uh, she has some black consciousness and that's pretty clear um, in her carriage. Christopher Sompel, as a white man, after listening to Dr. Oba, along with Dr. Clark, Dr. Van Sertum, and Dr. Bing, Ben, Malcolm Lass, but not least, I'm ashamed and embarrassed about white history of war and conquest. Yeah, it's basically white history. It's a history of war and conquest because that's basically um, their worldview. And so to dissent from it is important because not all whites subscribe to it. And uh, the main thing is to put in place a society not grounded in that. And I want to point out that, you know, Right now, you've got this Ukraine adventure going on. But the main reason you have poverty in this country is the way the country is structured. It's structured to make the rich rich, the poor poor. Um, but the national security state plays a big part in that. Most of the money is going in to financing the military industrial complex when there's no need for it. And the reason why China could make such a leap forward is one, 
it's putting its money and taking people out of poverty. Yeah, I think they could have done better using another model other than this, but they've taken about 500 million people out of poverty. Hmm? You know, and if you're looking at the Scandinavian countries, many of the others where people really have some benefits, it's because they're not investing in the war economy. And right now, this war making media is talking about how great it is Germany's going to put 2% of their economy, you know, their money and their economy into the war machine. Germany's got the strongest economy in Europe precisely because it has it, you know? And so why are your roads run down? Why are the schools uh, look like bomb shelter, especially for blacks? You know, why, why? This country doesn't invest in anything that's got to do with black, brown, red, yellow, or poor people of any color. Yeah, Brother Shabazz, I think Malcolm X had it right. Dems and GOPs are two wings of the same racist bird. Biden doesn't merit celebration. Yeah, true. But there was a reason that the grassroots and their wisdom moved to put him in place of uh, Trump. So that's the reason. But yeah, you're right. And um, as uh, Gore Vidal says, uh, there are two parties with one wing, both right wing. <laughs> so I agree with you. Christopher Sompel, why isn't there more short support shown for Obama's, I mean, uh, Biden's Supreme Court nominee? I think he, they haven't been asked for it. They don't need to. Um, but I, you know, I think that most blacks like the idea. So a lot of comments here, which is good. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, Obala U Wajika, um, makes a comment, create the world in which it will be no crime to be your, your children, the black mother, where I can find love that never changes smiles that are true and always just the same. Yeah, a world in which people are happy. We actually had a world like that for hundreds of thousands of years. And I'm not saying we're gonna go back to that world, but we have to draw the best from it. And in our hearts, a lot of black folks and a lot of people of color and a few whites have this kind of attitude towards life where they're not trying to impose pain and misery on people, you know? So um, what enables you to have a society without jails? What enables you to have a society without poverty? What, en what enables you to have a society without racism? What enables you to have a society without oppressing women and children and old people or anybody? You know, the answers are there. But some of us, if um, we buy into the Aryan or Western view of the world think that that just isn't possible. This is the best thing we can do. Get the best you can from here and just move on. Uh-uh. We can do better, you know. Well, Bali, you've got a lot of good things here to say. Um, be ever ready to defend or shape your mind 
to die naked woman, black woman, I sing your beauty that passes the form that I thick that I fix in the eternal. Yeah, the shape of the mind is very important. And that is really the ultimate beauty. And the black woman is a wonderful treasure. She's gone through a lot. And we need to have her back, give her all the support she needs to be what she can be while we're doing the same thing. Okay, we've got some beautiful poetry here. Let's see what else we got here. Okay, there's some comments here about what weakens us around lacking self-knowledge, having self-alienation, um, ignorance of our ethnic heritage, unbounded hedonism, narcissistic drives. I don't know what he's talking about, but um, yeah, if you have those, you got problems, you know. Okay, let's see what we have on the bottom here. Okay, this is a good question here. MD Madhouse Davis, I hope I haven't mispronounced your name. Can you speak to SF State Administration taking over Dr. McDougall's Black Unity Center and now controls it? The autonomy sought by Dr. McDougall with the BUC while still seeking budgetary support was difficult. Um, this uh, question is speaking to uh, BUC, which is a Black Unity Center created by one of the three best BSUs, Black Student Unions, that we've had at San Francisco State. And uh, the BSU um, forced the statewide California State University administration to fund this center to the tune of four or $500,000. And uh, Dr. McDougall, who was my replacement at San Francisco State, then took off time uh, as a uh, tenured faculty, full professor, to uh, temporarily chair uh, the Black Unity Center. And then he came under tremendous harassment uh, by the Black Unity Center and by the administration. Uh, they were, even when he had a phone call, they were going through somebody else. They would take their time paying students who worked to the center and McDougall would pay him out of his pocket. And then a whole series of things happened that threatened the very existence of the department itself. And the center uh, was one of those things at stake and I was in there helping McDougall and uh, the students. So um, I think that this is a fight that the students and faculty and community still have to wage to put this center back fully in uh, black students, uh, black faculty in the black community's pocket. 
So that's a fight that uh, has to be uh, fought and, uh, and won. But I'll say this, these students that created that center, they're some of the most brilliant students that we've had at State, and I mean brilliant. Um, Brother Quadro Dieterville, I don't believe that Obama had or has integrity or goodwill towards black African people. He signed the blue alert bill to protect police and is now against defending, is now against defending the police. Um, yeah, uh, Obama didn't mention race the whole time he was in office, except for two times. Um, one of them was Skippy Gates and Trayvon Martin. And even then, he took forever to frame how we would make a statement on Trayvon Martin. Obama was trained as a neoliberal, you know, so uh, there were certain agendas he was tied to. You should listen to what people say very little. That's most revealing. I'm a real, you hear me running my mouth. I'm a real good listener, real good. And I'm really good at listening to intent. Organizers, you know, should do this. Uh, and Obama, when he first ran for president, he said only once that he was more like Clinton than Hillary was. And Clinton was a neoliberalist, that is somebody who believed that you take public money and put it in private pockets, literally. There's a lot more to it. Um, he was silent on the... Um, takeover of the public school system in New Orleans, which his secretary of education said when referring to Katrina was the best thing that could happen and never said anything about it. You know what I mean? Uh, so, and that was under charter school. So the, the whole public school system has been chartered in uh, New Orleans. Obama was president. He didn't say anything about it didn't do anything to oppose it because he supports charter schools, you know? Yeah, so I'd agree that uh, Obama didn't do much for us. Some people don't like hearing that. And then Quadro Dieterville, Obama bombed Africa. He's a smiling overseer. Um, the same way that white heads of state smile while plotting genocide. I said he was a suspect before he was a nominated. Yeah. Uh, the learning curve. Did the Biden selected refuse to award damages to employees after the company refused to move the threat? I don't know what he's talking about there. Sun Temple. Sun Temple, you like my younger photograph. <laughs> yeah. Uh, people, black faculty at state used to hide behind this terror. <laughs> they were, I've told you before, when I cooled out a little bit, I got more spiritual. I went through a transformation that produced the mother principle. Uh, they thought I had lost my fighting thing. I wasn't frowning as much. Well, I, I'm not a smiler by nature, but I didn't change. I just got wiser. But yeah, that was <laughs> that was the terror of me, you know. Sun Temple, right on, brother. I really appreciate you all and your support, you know. Okay. Uh, Dieterville, yeah, his Obama's opposition as Biden as well as the Democratic Party as well, opposition to defunding the police. Yeah, somebody has to have a beer summit just because you call uh, a cop who arrests Skip Gates for going into his own house. So I think he called it dumb or wrong or something. You gotta have a beer, a beer summit to pacify the police. Of course, you're gonna support funding them. Though he's out of office now. So that's telling you maybe what, what he really thinks. That's too bad. Yeah, they need to be defunded. Um, they're the control unit. 
sent into the black community to keep us under containment. And as the rich get rich and the poor get poor, they're there to protect certain zones, you know, the zones of the rich, and then just come down on everyday black people, everyday people of color. Yeah, an attack by <clears throat> Obama on Jeremiah Wright. <clears throat> yeah, but Jeremiah Wright also exposed them to some stuff, so that was good. Yeah, Jeremiah Wright leads the Afrocentric movement in the black church. You know, let me see. <laughs> this is somebody who says, maybe Obama will do more in the future. Yeah, we always have the good side. Yeah, later for maybe. <laughs> he had his chance. And remember, he's born on my birthday. Huh? Uh -huh. And he did have qualities, one of which is a darn good organizer. Okay, so that's it. I enjoy doing this, and I enjoy all the, the folks who have taken part in this. And I would ask you to try and get 10 or so of your friends to uh, subscribe to the show and get them to watch. And if you have ideas on what you'd like to see us do with the show, let me know. So I've enjoyed this. Hotep to all of you. <laughs>